Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at RyanRoxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. I am your host, Ryan Roxy. How you doing? I mean, I am not behind the controls today. We have our illustrious producer, Vic, behind the controls again. So I'm feeling much more loosey-goosey, relaxed, because, and I should be, because guess what it is? It's Friday the 13th. How is your Friday the 13th going? Huh? How many times have you listened to Alice Cooper's Man Behind the Mask today? Come on, be honest, be honest. But if you're listening to us on an audio broadcast right now, um, or if you're listening to us on Facebook, Thank you so, so much. But guess what? We want you here on the YouTube official channel right there where Vic just put that subscribe button on. Hit that subscribe button. Go on to Ryan Roxy official. That's on the YouTube platform. And you can check out each and every single one of our episodes of In the Trenches because here you can be in the live chat, which I see the live chat faithful are there. What's happening on this Friday the 13th live chat? Everything good? It's Roxy All Access Friday. It's In the Trenches Friday. And I am ready to roll. Are you? Let's go. All right. I am always impressed with not just rock royalty, but show business royalty. Visit us here in the trenches. And this week, our guest proves that just resting upon those fortunate beginnings and reputation is not in his method. Hard work and hard rock are, though. So whether it's paying tribute to his father's musical legacy or creating his own music along with his twin brother Matthew in the band Nelson, would you welcome Into the Trenches? Guitarist, songwriter, and a guy with a name that is built for being in a band. Gunnar Nelson. Hello, <laughs> Gunnar. Hey, Ryan. How's it going? Hey, to all the viewers out there. What's going down, man? We were just talking about your name right before we started the podcast. And I was saying that I'm recording this from the North Pole. I'm in Sweden. And you said, well, Gunnar. Yeah. Gunnar. You know, is it? Well, yeah. My father was Eric, right? And his father was Oswald. And Eric with a K. Was Anders, right? And be, his father was Magnus. So, oh, yeah. That is Scandinavian all the way, my friend. We were we were going back and forth of who owned Trondheim at this point or who rules it. Uh, we're just going to blanket Gunner as being Scandinavian name, but it's all rock. When you Gunnar, you could be in a band, but you could also work at a bakery. Gunner, <laughs> you know, Gunner is nothing but a band member, right? And, and it's when, just Gunner. That's right. <laughs> when did it start for you? When did that fascination, were you just, you know, did you pop right out, you know, basically exposed to music, obviously? I mean, when did it really hit you? Well, I, I think my first memory, my first conscious memory was sitting on a little apple crate to the side of the stage, watching my father perform in Southern California at an amusement park called Knott's Berry Farm. They had a theater there. It's called the John Wayne Theater now. Uh, yeah, there you go. But uh, much earlier than that picture. But uh, um, just kind of making that connection of my dad was on stage. He was having a great time and the audience was having a great time. And at the time I was enamored with drums because I love gear. I'm a kid. So um, I saw that and I went, that's something that I really want to do. And I, I, my, I talked to my mom about that when she was still here. And uh, she said, boy, you were about two and a half, three years old when that happened. And it was right around that time that my dad was rehearsing his Stone Canyon band in the family house in the Hollywood Hills. And when they would take any, any infrequent breaks, I was always down there playing the drums and, and driving his drummer crazy. So finally, at around five years of age, he broke down. He went down to Ventura Boulevard. And he, he went to a pawn shop, bought a pawn shop drum kit and uh, moved that into the hayloft above the barn and wow. uh, put me out there. And Matthew followed about a year later and, uh, and bought a downsized Fender bass, a music master bass. And we were playing along to uh, Alice Cooper records to learn how to play. So there you go. I love it. So you originally were a powerhouse rhythm section. We, we actually went all the way through, uh, boy, uh, grade school, junior high, high school, playing the L.A. club scene professionally from the time we were 12 years of age. Uh, as a duo, we always had a power trio. We loved bands like the, the Police when we were growing up. And, 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 and you know, Matt and I were just a, a rhythm section. We loved playing. Uh, bass and drums together and still to this day when we're recording 
we get a chance to do that. And we love doing it. But I realized, as you probably did too, Ryan, that you get 30% more chicks when you put down the drums and you pick up the guitar. So uh, I, I you know, know it's, a, it's a hell of a lot more. I didn't know you broke it down to a percentile. Yes, I just yes, knew that I being the technical. drummer, being the drummer, you had to come first, leave last, and usually right. own, own own the van or own. Look, or, it's, now playing drums is visceral. I love being a drummer first and foremost. And it's funny when people ask me, like, you know, what do you do? I've been playing guitar for a lot longer than I, I was a drummer first and foremost. But I always kind of look at myself that way, and I approach playing guitar the way a drummer would. You know, I, I, I was always kind of the meat and potatoes of Nelson when we started out. And now with the trip that we're doing right now, I, I approach the instrument uh, more rhythmically than I do melodically. Right. Well, just to go back real quick, uh, sure. for those of you that were confused about Knott's Berry Farm reference, um, think of it as a Disneyland knockoff. Because I, I spent much of my youth going into, oh, there's a nice family <laughs> shot as well. Um, Ground spent- control to Major Tom. <laughs> I would go down to LA area and um, go pretty much every summer. I grew up in the Bay area, but um, folks would, my, my mom's family all lived down that, that area right around Knott's Berry farm. So that was sort of our knockoff Disneyland. And, and then the Mecca, I don't know if, you know, growing up, cause we're around the same age. Wasn't the Mecca always magic mountain because that had the rides. Magic mountain was super cool. Especially when you got to be like a teenager. And you, you want to ride roller coasters all the time and, and do all that. Magic Mountain was always really great. They had a, a ride there called the Colossus, which was the biggest wooden roller coaster in the world for a long time. And then they, they put the world's first looped coaster, which was called the Revolution. And uh, it's changed a lot over the years. But uh, yeah. Colossus, yeah, I mean, it was pretty right? cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but, and that was like a, a wood. And the thing was, I mean, Yes, Disneyland was great, and you go there every time, anytime your grandparents would pay for it, or you know, you, it was a special trip. Knott's right. Berry Farm was kind of like you, you just went there because you know it was there and it was kind of close. And but Magic Mountain, for for me at least, was that special trip where you just wanted to go and ride the rides all friggin' day. Totally, and, 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 I, and, I, and I probably. I wouldn't have gone to Knott's Berry Farm at all had my father not been performing there. But, you know, <laughs> as you can imagine, you know, you got a pop who's up there on stage, but that allows you to uh, to to do the, the the backdoor entrances to all of the rides. And you get to be as his kid, get to go out there with like a little guide and and all that stuff. And that was so much fun to get a chance to do that as, as a little kid. And, you know, I, I actually loved everything that went along with being in a musical family. I mean, for us, it was just really normal. It was our normal. You know, people, yeah. people ask what it was kind of like. And for me, I kind of explained it'd be like the same as being a Manning, I would think, you know, if you came <laughs> from a football family. Always and, been around sports. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and your father was Archie and you had a, you know, Peyton was your brother and, and you could talk about football and you had this great social proof that making uh, or that playing football at the highest of levels was absolutely possible because it was around you all the time. For me, when I was growing up, I was growing up during my, my father's second phase of his career. He had a he was credited as founding the whole country rock movement. And it was about 1966, 67. And he was putting that band together in our home. And I just thought because of that, I mean, I was born into that. So he always was around with a Martin acoustic guitar in his hand, writing a song. And people were always coming over. And, and I just thought that singing harmony was what everybody did. I didn't know that it was really special. So kind of grew up doing that. And when you have neighbors like George Harrison or, uh, gosh, I mean, uh, Linda Ronstadt would stop by and the Crosby, Stills and Nash guys would stop by and stuff. And that was just normal for us. That was canyon life, canyon rock life. I love it. And this it was, sounds, by the way, I, I wore my special shirt for you, Ryan. My Laurel, Laurel Canyon, Canyon man. There yeah. it is at the country store. This is not just a show about rock and roll, folks. It's a show about amusement parks. And, uh, you know, every <laughs> once in a while, you get really bummed out and your parents would take you to Marine World Uh-oh. where nobody wanted to go. That's but, when you've been bad. That's right. This sounds a lot to me like, Vic. This sounds a lot like going back to get forward, doesn't it, to you? <laughs> So we are talking with mm-hmm. Gunnar Nelson. Um, we're talking some old school, uh, going back to get forward. We're talking about the formation of uh, his band, what became uh, Nelson. And uh, my first question is, there, there's lots of brother bands out there. You know, you look at Van Halen, Oasis, the Bee Gees. Um, what's the catch of coming from a twin brother band? 
Well, technically, I mean, Matthew and I are identical twins. So we literally split from the same cell. So genetically speaking, our vocal cords are the same, uh, at least physiologically and stuff. So, I mean, I don't think there's anything quite as cool as, as vocals being sung by siblings. I mean, there's a blend there that, I mean, historically has been going on forever. And you can, you can tell it's kind of, kind of cool and kind of magic. But uh, with the two of us, it's like when my dad was doing his early rockabilly stuff, he was always either double tracking himself in the studio right. or he was singing his own harmony to himself. We actually got to do that live, you know, and, <laughs> and, and not have to overdub it. So it worked out great. But Matt and I have always been been singing together. It started out differently, though, Ryan, because when we when we first started out, as I mentioned, we were super young. So we started when or got our first instruments at, at five or six. And uh, we had our first recording session uh, at 11, started playing the LA club scene professionally from the time we were 12. So the irony being people kind of associate us with that whole sunset strip scene uh, that, that was going on with the metal scene in the, uh, in the eighties. But Matthew and I started way so before young. That. Yeah, yeah. Like, like 10 years before the LA club scene was incredibly vibrant. There was so much activity there and it was during that time of all the skinny tie bands. So, they, you had the new waivers and you had uh, the, the, the punks. It's kind of yeah. like the sharks and the jets, you know? You had those two worlds. But, uh, but bands the like scene was the ripping. knack. Would I, yes. could I say a band like the knack? Um, new wave type bands. How were you guys able to play the clubs being so young? Did you have, did you get slid in the back door or, how, or you or could well, only was, come when you're on stage and then you had to get ushered right off? Or did you just say, hey, you know, my dad? Well, you know, it's that's a great it. question. Oh. If we had just been playing infrequently, it wouldn't have been a big deal. But we were playing so much uh, at that time that it, it did become a problem. So there was a wonderful person named Michelle Meyer, and she was the booker at Madame Wong's West. And Madame Wong's <laughs> West was a it's just a legendary club there in Santa Monica. I ran sound at Madame Wong's West downstairs. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. And everybody, okay. and so, so I think yes, I made so you, a lot of people angry at me running sound downstairs at Madame Wong's West. <laughs> but oh, yeah, I know yeah. that club. So, so you know, uh, Esther, the Dragon Lady Wong, liked me and Matthew. Yes. Um, uh, we occasionally got to play for her husband, George, in Chinatown because they kind of separated those two. And uh, uh, Michelle, at the time, was the booker of Wong's West. And she believed in me and Matthew. She, she thought we were cool because... We didn't play like a couple of 12 year olds. I mean, we, we really took it very, very seriously. So uh, we were playing at the same level as uh, those, those other contemporary bands. Like we were sharing the stage with, you mentioned the Knack and they were great. I love them. Uh, the Knack, the Go-Go's, the, the Plimsolls. The um, Plimsolls, Animotion maybe. Animotion no. was around that. I, I used to go see the, a lot of bands that would play Jack, uh, um, the Rembrandts, uh, that uh -huh. whatever band was before the Rembrandts that 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 he was in, um, you know, just who wrote um, uh, "Am on the phone booth is a one across the wall." Jack, oh man, all right, someone in the chat's gonna help me out with that. <laughs> but yeah, but a, a lot of new wave bands, and you were side by side with them. Well, we were, we were actually sharing the stage with all of those those bands, and I try to explain to people what people think that that the the metal scene was tough on the sunset strip those guys were wimps you know if you actually really wanted to to learn your chops or, or pay your dues you know you were the nelson boys at 12 13 years of age playing those stages with a bunch of incredibly heroin heroin addicted people playing jangle pop and <laughs> boy man they would knife you if you went five minutes over your set time they'd sabotage your equipment you know they talk crap about you on stage wow. when they were doing their set because no one wants to be schooled by a couple of 12 year olds. It's embarrassing, you know? So, yeah. you know, we got a lot of, a lot of crap and that's great. And it prepared us for what was, what was to come. It's never really been an easy road, but it was Michelle Meyer, the booker at Wong's West that got together with us. We went down to city hall and we petitioned city hall to actually pass an ordinance that allowed underage performers to go in, perform as long as they were escorted by a guardian and then go right back out. That's our law. That, that we did all holy that crap stuff. that's nelson's rule yeah so um and that was nelson you know, alert yeah nelson's and was, law yeah and, <laughs> and, and it was cool because you know getting to play those clubs as you've done so much you know what i'm talking about there's nothing like it you know every gig that you do now when you're out there on a big stage and you got your deli trays and your personal assistants and a real dressing room what a luxury yeah. because back then man if you had a corner of a broom closet you were lucky
you know? Uh, and, there, and there was a lot of broom closets in um, Madame Mong's West. You know that that place was an old mortuary? Yes, because day. I was talking to Esther one day, and there was a big, beautiful elevator that went yes. from the downstairs, the load-in, to all the, the floors, right? And you did sound uh, downstairs. We mostly played downstairs when we were starting, of course, because you have to pay your dues. You play downstairs. Then when you start pulling people, they put you upstairs. That was like a big yeah. promotion. Yeah. But what I didn't know, I was in the elevator loading in with Esther and, and having a conversation, which was difficult anyways. But she she mentioned, uh, we mentioned how wonderful the, the elevator was. It was huge. She goes, oh, yeah, this is how they move the bodies. He said, move the bodies? What are you talking about? Oh, just a mortuary. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. you really? Yeah. And so yeah. the yeah. downstairs was the embalming room where you did sound was the embalming room. And upstairs, oh, I, I did room. a lot of I did a lot of embalming down in that uh, that downstairs uh, room as well. I mean, and even in the elevator. I mean, you have to understand. You were twelve. I was twenty. I did a lot of wrong things in that entire establishment. In fact, it was one of my first. It was one of my first jobs in Los Angeles. Moving down there was doing sound, and I wouldn't really call it doing being a sound technician at, at Madame Wong's. I never put that on my resume, but. Um, I also was one of my first gigs with an with a artist from the first band I ever played in uh, called Jeff Scott. And that's where I was poached at Madame Ong's West by Candy, who was a power pop Candy band. Candy was a big deal there. Candy I was, was like in, a big draw. Yeah. Well, there you go. I ended up joining <laughs> Candy because of that, um, because of playing with Jeff Scott, poached at Madame Wong's West. And then, of course, Candy, for me, led into so many things, playing with Gilby for years, and and then eventually, you know, Electric Angels, and then Electric Angels turned into my opportunity with Alice Cooper. And, and it's just like, like and, and it's funny how it all re revolves around this club, Madame Wong's, because the booker that became after Michelle was Jonathan Daniel, who was the bass player in Candy, bass player in Electric Angels, and now is mogul manager of like Green Day, um, Train, um, Panic, uh, uh, Fall Out Boy, uh, wow. Weezer. He's, he's a mogul. So there you go. So much <laughs> rock and roll love came out of that one club. So many people went through that club, played that club, worked there, and... Uh, it was a different time, as you know. I mean, there there was a real club scene in Los Angeles that was competitive and vibrant. And I think it all changed when they went to that whole pay-to-play thing, which would have yeah. been mid-80s, kind of, 86 yeah. But at that point, you guys were out of it, and you guys were out of there, and you guys had already established Nelson. I want to I want to stick with the, you know, you're getting pushback from uh, some of these other bands. You know, they don't want to be schooled by a, a young, young set of brothers. Um, What's it like between the two of you, though, being that you're twins? Are there arguments or because you're twins, do you just like all of a sudden hands like, you know, go the same way? Vocal, you know, resonance is the same. Or is there just as much tension? Well, it, um, both, to be honest with you, you know, family, it's tough working with family. As you, as you know, for anybody who's out there who does any kind of work, any kind of business of any kind with family, it can get a little testy. Um, but it just means that you're passionate about it. I mean, the one thing Matthew and I always shared was, I mean, we really, really, really take the music seriously. We want to honor music because we're students of it. We love it genuinely. Cause as you know, I mean, you can basically make a better living doing pretty much anything else. It's really tough doing this. You know, you got to really love what you do. And, uh, Matt and I, for every similarity that we have as twins, we also have, uh, some profound differences, you know, uh, Matt, is the kind of guy, he's like the family Kissinger. He will think things through before he expresses himself. And he's kind of the, the, peace me, the peacemaker. Um, I have zero filter, man. So, I mean, I, I'm one of these guys that just comes right out and says it. And, um, you know, the, the good part is you never have to guess where I'm coming from. Uh, the, the bad thing is there's some, some people who, um, who've been offended through the years. And, you know, that kind of sucks. But I, I never intended that. But um, I know how to get things done. So between me and Matthew, it's really complimentary. You know, it's kind of one of those things where we realized in the beginning of doing this, when we started out just kind of by default, because I was back on the drums, I was the backup singer. I was the singing backup singer and yeah. Matt was the lead singer on the bass. And we, uh, we experienced a, a shift right after our, our father died and we were working towards getting signed to Geffen Records. We were working with a co-writer, friend of ours, a guy named Mark Tanner. And uh, we went into the studio one day and um, I, I love this story. Matthew denies it and 
I lived it. it this, this is how it happens. But there's a reason why I became the lead singer in Nelson. And I, I have to give thanks to Captain James T. Kirk because okay. the Star Trek marathon was on that day in the studio. And we were in the studio making a demo, which wound up being one of the first songs that, that got us signed to Geffen. And uh, gosh, we were young. Like it was a year after my dad died. So we were like 19. And Matt had always taken for granted that he was going to be the guy singing, singing lead. Uh, and we were in the studio. We, we had done everything we possibly could have done. There's like a lounge and then you go through two doors and then there was a studio room and Mark and I were uh, making the record and I, I loved studio stuff. So that was always something that attracted me. And we spent all the time in there and we were done with everything, Ryan, everything was recorded except for the lead vocal. And I went in and say, Hey Matt, it's, you know, you're on, it's, it's your turn. And it happened to be the Tribble episode during the Star Trek marathon. <laughs> and it was right at the good part. And the he Tribble didn't episode. And he didn't want to break from the Tribble episode. It's like the Star Trek marathon is on. It's going to be over in 20 minutes. I'll be in when it's done. And, uh, ooh, nice. <laughs> Thank nice. you very much, Vic, William very Shatner. Good. Thank Love you, Vic Chalfant. Yes. <laughs> James T. And so uh, I went back into the studio and I told Mark what Matt had said. And he said, hey, just throw something down just, just as a placeholder. And I sang the lead vocal very quickly. And he said, hey, sing the next one. So I sang the next one. And he said, okay, sing the last one. I sang the last one. And then Matthew walked in after the, the Star Trek marathon was over and all the lead vocals were sung. And he, he, was, he was pissed. It's like, you know, what, what's this all about? And, uh, and what we did was we realized that was kind of the beginning of Nelson's sound. My voice is far more chesty and throaty and better suited for holding down the, the, main, the main vocal. And Matthew can sing higher than I can. So that was when Mark said, hey, you know, just try a harmony on this stuff, Matt. You know, we can always replace the vocal with yours later. Matt sang the first harmony vocal and it was, in, it was really apparent that that was the Nelson sound. That was the no. moment that it, that it clicked. So between and the it, two of you, your producer and William Shatner, that's where the, the sort of magic and mojo happened. James Tiberius day. Kirk and the Tribbles. That's that's what did it. Wow, that's a great story. Um, I'm you know because because you don't have to put the words out of your mouth, but they always sound good when you hear them. And uh, of the two of you, who's the Lennon and who's the McCartney? Wow. You know, it's it's I would probably be the Lennon, and Matthew okay. would would probably be the McCartney, but. I gotta be honest with you, man. Um, of course, I, I I love his uh, his writing and stuff, but I'm not a huge John Lennon fan as a human being, as a father. So you, so, so you go more towards you lean. I towards go more Pitt towards McCartney. Uncle. I'm no, I'm Uncle George. I'm uh, George Uncle Harrison. George, there George you go. is my guy. Well, he was your neighbor. He was also your neighbor. You said, and he was a lovely, lovely man. At the time, I was a really young kid, but he was coming. He lived next door for a year and a half. He rented a house. And he would come over and hang out with my pop and they would go into his man cave and listen to vinyl. And uh, he would kind of like deconstruct all the James Burton solos and, and they would talk music because they were both music fans. And he was always over. And I remember how just incredibly gentle he was. I didn't know what a, a British accent was. I just called him funny voice guy, but he was the sweetest <laughs> guy in the world. And it just so happened that as I started making music and being a writer, um, everybody talks about, John and Paul, and it's, come on, it'll never happen again. It's the most amazing duo in the history of music. Um, but George was who I really gravitated towards. I, I loved his writing. I loved his soul in his songs. I loved his guitar playing. You know, I absolutely loved his guitar playing, not just his slide playing, which was unbelievable, but just overall the way he approached the instrument. And uh, that's who I really emulated. So. I think it's really Paul and George, and I think we need to hire out for the John when we ever like put something together. I always have to hire an, an edgy blues bass guitar player to play against my George Harrison melodic guitar work, because if it's all sweet, it sounds lame. So you got to have that sweet with the sour, and and that really is uh, is really the the sound that works for us. Well, I do find it quite interesting that if you count up the gigs, I'll bet Ringo's the one that's played the most amount of gigs over the years. I bet you he's, right. been, he's been doing his all-stars, you know, he's steady and slow and steady, just like, uh -huh. it's kind of like he is. He's the turtle, the race, yeah. of the turtle in the hair. And Ringo has just kept on playing gigs and gigs. So the guys played the most of the Beatles, post Beatles, 
yeah. was probably Ringo Starr. Ringo was always the sleeper Ringo of the group. You know, yeah. I mean, he, he was the cut up and stuff, but the no, no, no song is freaking brilliant, man. You know, and, and that's when I was a kid and, and kind of like growing song. up, you know, I grew up during the Wings generation. You know, that was what was on AM radio at the time. We had K WKHJ in Los Angeles at the time. And yep. AM radio was, you didn't have a, 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 an FM component to it. And Not this is a couple of years they, later, yeah. Okay, so this is before they formatted radio. I want you to imagine a time when you turn on the radio station that you could, everyone could get service. It was an AM station in Los Angeles. And you could hear everything from... Uh, you know, Kiki D and Elton John singing next to Led Zeppelin, singing next to a Beatles tune. It was all over the map. You sound exactly like me when I do interviews. I talk about KFRC up in the Bay Area because that was my Dr. Don Rose was my uh, morning DJ. And he would play Aerosmith next yeah. to the next to the Commodores. Yes. Next to, you know, uh, Cheap Trick next to Earth, Wind and Fire. And yeah. I would love it. How cool is that? Because, look, I mean, all of us with our playlist nowadays, Look, we're not we're not just compartmentalized to the point of where we only listen to one kind of music. You pull out music based on your mood, based on your memories. You know, they're little musical time machines. They take you to a certain place in your life that you want to remember. You put it on, you know. And to me, I'm all over the place in my playlist. I've got a whole bunch of stuff. I that whole singer songwriter era of the '70s, which you know a lot of people call yacht rock. Personally, oh. I admire that so much because they didn't have any gimmicks or tricks. You were limited technologically you you were if you were lucky you had an eight track recorder if you were lucky most people didn't it's like more f like four track so i was just time, listening to that song on yacht Rock, the marimba solo that we talked i went through a whole thing down youtube of that most amazing marimba solo of all time guess that you know what song i'm talking about uh yeah hang on a second um a pina colada song right it, it's not pina colada it's it's um um it's not after midnight um it's 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 one of those yacht rock songs, probably the yacht rock song. And they talk about this marimba solo. It was a first take. It was a one take deal. Well, so people were, people were one take people back then. That's that. But the point that I was musicianship was high. Yeah, you didn't have auto tune. Okay, you didn't have endless tracks, so you really had to like think about it as a creator. And you were limited with the instrumentation because it was before synthesizers, really. Uh, right. of what you were going to do to make because back then with the, the lack of formatting it was all about a hit if you had a hit song a hit song was a hit song right so in the pursuit of a hit these people were having to write really creative songs and they all wanted to sound unlike today they wanted to sound totally unique they didn't want to sound like anybody else they didn't want to follow a trend they wanted to stick out from the crowd and so they would write these really really clever songs making the most of their limitations and giving us, you know, just a really, really different and I think really brave art. And I love that whole era from that. I, I think the limitation actually gave us a lot of creativity. Absolutely. Well, someone for the love of God in the chat, uh, Google best rock marimba solo of all time. And the song will come up and please put it in the comments so we can put it up here. Now I it's like going to know. bother me. Now it's going to bother me for the rest of the podcast until someone finds out what this yacht rock marimba solo was, because it, it obviously influenced all of us. AM radio influenced us and our bands. Um, there does seem a definite element of pop that's that's been um in your history of music sure. you, you, and you and you guitar driven pop um if you will and that's how i want to sort of before we go on our, a quick little commercial break i want to just briefly want to talk about how nelson in that um you know early 90s late 80s came about and you, and you said that, uh, you know, you'd already formed the sound. You figured out the sound, thanks to William Shatner. And um, in part. Those hot Swedish chicks. <laughs> oh, my God. Moonlight <laughs> feels right. Because the moonlight <laughs> feels right. That was it. That was the name of the song. Yeah. Moonlight feels right. Now, who was the artist there, Kanak? I love it. The greatest <laughs> solo of all time. I mean, Man, have you ever heard the guitar awesome. solo at the end of Orleans, Still the One? Oh, great. I, great. I, I mean, like great i mean great guitar playing and uh you know yeah you're 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 on it as far as like the tone is concerned what made me and matt different when we came out with nelson and i think it's from growing up with our dad's stone canyon band the whole country rock thing around the laurel canyon scene what was going on at the troubadour club with your jackson browns and Joni mitchells and 
and Buffalo Springfields and all stuff that I grew up with. Matthew and I, unlike everybody else that was getting signed at the time to the rock labels, we didn't come from a blues background. There was really no blues in our playing, you know. Um, we found, and it's just my opinion, look, I love my Aerosmith. I love my ACDC. Um, I love my Alice Cooper. I love all of it. <laughs> but but there's such a, a foundation in 145 blues and all of that music. Matt and I came from country pop folk in Southern California. That was our background. Gotcha. So when, when we came out with, like I said, the first song was Love and Affection. It was, I'm very proud of the fact, it was the first number one song since Tambourine Man that an electric 12 string led the way. And, and that's just because we grew up with that kind of instrumentation, that kind of headspace. You know, um, in, in Geffen Records, we were signed to John David Kolodner. Uh, Geffen was very smart. He had three different A&R guys in the building. They were all in competition with each other. Okay. They had job security, but they, it was all ego. They wanted to outdo each other. So did you get signed by the right guy or did you get signed by the wrong guy? I got signed by absolutely the right guy. Awesome. I got, I got signed by John. Now, let me ask you this second yep. question. Did that right guy unfortunately end up leaving the company or get fired or change jobs uh, before your album came out? That's a fantastic question. And to all the it viewers happens. out there, uh, to the, the viewers out there, that when Matt and I were coming up, here's what we did. We were smart enough to realize that at record companies, the, the people that would sign, they're called a &R guys. If you're lucky, most a &R guys have a shelf life at a company of maybe six months. Normally, that's the way it was. Six months, and then they would put their name on a, put their stamp on a, on a project that they were passionate about, that tanked, and they got fired. So when we were coming up, we were thinking, okay, this is going to take a little while to continue the development, to get it to the level that we want it to, to be at, we need to see if there's an a &R guy that is in the least amount of danger of getting fired as anybody else. Now, at the time, John Kolodner, who was in the Dude Looks Like a Lady video for Aerosmith, turns around, he's he, got the beard. That's he a real reinvented, guy. reinvented Aerosmith. Yes, he got, he, got re, he got Aerosmith into rehab and put them back together again. He also, when he worked at Atco, signed ACDC. You know, he worked with Foreigner. Um, this guy's a legend. You know, he, yeah. he, he yeah. knew music and at this particular time for better or worse, he was at this place where he was sending Tyler and his boys back in the studio to record entire albums all over again. OK, yeah. so there was a, a bit of an ego power trip thing going on there. And I, I got to tell you, Ryan, look, don't mess with me and my music. I've got a very clear vision about I mean, I hear it in my head done before I write it. I see it on a stage before I put it together. I know what it's going to be. And John, it was his way or the highway. That's just the way it was. And he wasn't very but those two at those two views are going to eventually collide. It was it was, you know, oil and water. And apparently it was the same thing with Steven Tyler, too. I mean, John was very, very difficult on the people that he worked with because he, he had this feeling he'd said in interviews that, you know, oh, the lead singer with their ego, they need to be taken down a peg and what, whatever his process was. And I'm telling you, it wasn't easy it gave us some great music. So w whatever way it happens, it's fine. It it's not comfortable. You know, giving birth is not comfortable, you know, and if John Kalodner was your midwife, it was a very painful delivery. Okay. <laughs> but you made a beautiful baby. Well, not, it's, yeah. it's nice. I wish we had been able to release that first Nelson record two and a half, three years earlier than we were. Um, John got sidetracked on things. He was working on Aerosmith's pump record. He was doing a share record. Uh, White Snake, the White, the White Snake record. He just put it together. So we were this little tiny baby band that, um, for better or worse, would have been a high profile signing. You'll, you're never going to see uh, one of those pictures from the trades of me and Matthew sitting down with David Geffen and John Kolodner signing the contract. Like <laughs> you'd see that music connection every week, right? And right, and right. in our day, you, you have will to wear never, socks first. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> you, you're never going to find that picture because of. Uh, nepotism or accusations of nepotism or bands that have come from uh, a family in the past that have tanked, even John Kalodner wasn't willing to risk that happening. So, right. you know, they say success has many parents and failure is an orphan. You know, that, okay. that, that kind of happened. Good with point. Me and Matt. Yeah. All right. All right. Now, did John Kalodner, was he still there when the record came out? Yes. So, so, yeah, yeah, so, no. yeah. so basically, I'll, so, so it didn't happen where, cause just last week we had Richie Rano from the band stars and it was a very similar story on up until the point where right before the record comes out, 
the A and R guy loses his job, right? And then therefore right. the company switches directions, switches, you know. Yeah. Well, it's that's that's a terrible scenario. Uh, we actually had some pretty good Tommy John was there, um, but the whole paradigm shifted. Ryan, think about this. Uh, Geffen realized much like back in the day with the death of disco, which was totally engineered, by the way, if you think about it, the business guys that ran the industry at the time, disco was the 800 pound gorilla. It was making people scads of money, but it got to the point where it got like all forms of music and all trends, it got bloated and expensive. So in the era of Donna Summer demanding a million dollars an album, and that's in that day's money, it was like $10 million in today's money. Right. All the there's like six power brokers in the music business at the rival labels. They all know each other. They're all friends. They all coordinate. They got together and they said, hey, this is too expensive. But I've heard of this trip that's going on over in England. It's called Punk. You give them a dime bag and a McDonald's Happy Meal and they'll do whatever you want. And right. so everything changed overnight. Like on a Tuesday, you know, everybody had boogie fever on a Wednesday. You know, they, you know, uh, they were they were listening to everything coming out of England, and it was a, a really violent shift in music. Warp forward to our day, we were like the last of the confidence rockers. We were the last guys from the living on a prayer era because David Geffen had the same kind of moment at that time, and everything had gotten bloated. We were making, you know, half million dollar music videos and stuff like that. Now, granted, yeah. it was all getting charged back to our account. Oh, it's recoupable, baby. It is every single penny, but you know, someone's got to come up with the money in the beginning. And then they've caught in word. They, they got word of the scene that was happening up in Seattle where you could go up and you can license a finished record from sub pop for 20 grand, the whole True. thing done, go up, forget the the half million dollar videos. You can go up there and license a record from sub pop. And they happen to do it with a little band called Nirvana on my label. So That's we go right. out. Nirvana was on Geffen. Yes. And so is Nelson at the time. And yes. there is a paradigm shift. And, and I know this pain, this is a painful question, but do you think that Beavis and Butthead might have had something to do with ruining your career? Because not I, at I've all. asked it. Okay, because not... Winger, because because Kip Winger to this day, <laughs> how do you have that, Vic? How do you randomly have a picture of Beavis and Butthead? I, that was not, that was just me, like, remembering something that Kip Winger had said a long time ago to me, saying, Beavis and Butthead ruined my career. Oh, I know. I <laughs> talked to, look, I talked to Kip yesterday. I talked to him yesterday. We, we, we rib each other all the time. I said, Kip, you know, you didn't learn from Colonel Parker, okay? And you need to find a sense of humor about the whole thing, because he still, to this day, says, oh, you know, they... <laughs> Metallica guys threw darts at me in their video and and between that and Beavis and Butthead with Stuart the neighbor wearing a winger shirt, it ruined my career. I said, if you had been able to laugh at yourself and act yeah. more like a Nelson, they would have let, I mean, it's, it's basically, he didn't go to England like we did before he released his record. You got to be able to rip up on yourself. You have to. Right. Otherwise they go for the jugular. Now, back in his day, I, I told him this story. I said, you know, Colonel Parker, when he was managing Elvis, was an absolute genius because, you know, Elvis back in the day, he was clearly a polarizing force. He was making race music and there are a lot of people hated him. You know, they thought it was a cultural attack. And right. Colonel Parker, so smart, he went out and he manufactured like millions of buttons that said, I hate Elvis. So if you were an Elvis fan, you went out and you bought his records. If you weren't an Elvis fan, you bought one of those buttons. And the he Colonel created Elvis, the polarization. And, and Colonel Parker and Elvis made money either way. Wow. So well, you know what? what I, I've heard that. Well, you're telling me this story. But the other story I've heard where he's not so bright is that Colonel Parker never had a passport. And that's the reason why Elvis never toured Europe. That's not true. That's oh, not true. Oh, so true. It's, it's fiction. Yeah, Wait it's a second. Well, my, my dad's manager for 20 years was a gentleman named Greg McDonald. And Greg McDonald grew up as Colonel Parker's right-hand man. So I've heard all of these stories and they're okay. all, they're incredibly fascinating. And I have he, always heard that story that the reason, why didn't Elvis, you know, he's basically the biggest thing in the world without even touring another half of the world, which would yeah. even have garnished him even more fame. But like, what's the story? Are you well, how you're much thinking more, not against? To be honest with you, Ryan, think about this. How much more famous could you really be? Like, like mm. really when you're Elvis, like, you know, yeah, at that time, you so, might be right. You might yeah, be on so something. He was thinking, you know what? I don't need to leave America. I can just stay here. 
And, you know, of course, then it morphed into the movies, which was very smart. You know, when when uh, the, that got him over that got him overseas exposure anyway. Right. Right. And, yeah. and to this day, the difference between Ricky Nelson and Elvis Presley, my dad only made one great movie, which was Rio Bravo with John Wayne. And it's classic. It's a legendary movie. And and that gets shown all the time. Once you're captured in film and it's a great film, it lives forever. Unlike a TV show, if you're in a movie, they keep on, every generation keeps on seeing those movies and discovering those movies all over again. And in a real sense, it keeps you immortal. And so you know who I think it. is immortalized? Damone from Fast Times or Ridgemont High. Yeah. Damone, from the, see, I don't care whatever movie Damone, the, the actor, doesn't do for the rest of his life. He was in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Come on. I Vic want you to want me. She comes, stays, lays, or prays. <laughs> you know, your toes are still tapping. Absolutely. Dude, I love it. I The only reason I, I, I laid that little softball in for our producer, Vic, is because before the show, I saw that he had left up some Fast Times clips. I'm like, if I can work a Damone quote somehow in this interview with Gunner today, I'm going to. And there it was. I Home know run, Damone folks. quotes. Ah, oh, Debbie. dude. Hi. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> She'll have the linguine with clam sauce yeah. and Coke, I think it is. I'll have the same. Yeah. It's a classy move. Yep, there it there, is. There, there it, it is. is. I had else. So, so if someone can show me or not show me uh, Colonel Parker's passport picture, then I then I will completely believe it. But then again, I'd always heard that uh, did, did Colonel Parker have a passport? I believe he did. Yeah, I believe Shit. he did. You're going yeah. head to head with me on this one. Yeah. All right, all right. So, I, I mean, all these years I've been telling a bullshit story, which no, is no, no, never not, not all. I mean, rock and roll legends that way. You know, you get half truths from people, and it's like a game of telephone. How are you supposed to know? I'm just pretty close to the source, and what I'm going to do for you, I will follow up with Greg, and I'll see if I can get that picture for you. I love it. I love it. Well, you know what? That's That falls into never let the truth get in the way of a good story because, I mean, things are going quick right now, and uh, you said this at the beginning of the podcast, uh, Gunner, that we would just get caught up, and it would be, time would be flying by, yeah. and it is flying by. It is. Um, but we have a little sexism call uh, Never Let the Truth Get in the Way of a Good Story. Okay. Our boss, Alice Cooper, says that, my boss. And um, basically, that was one of the things I wanted to ask about. Uh, it was obviously fiction that I've been telling this story about Colonel Parker having a passport or, or not. We don't know. But, but, here we go. Here's a question. Okay. Are you in the Guinness Book of World Records? Yes, sir. That is a fact, folks. And you know why? I want you to tell the folks why, or do you want me to tell the folks why? Uh, well, um, I'm happy to. Uh, my my grandfather, Ozzy, and that's the, the real TV family dad, Ozzy Nelson, not Ozzy Osbourne. Um, Ozzy and Harriet Nelson. That's right. Now, they had a, a family television show called The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, which was the longest, the longest running, mm -hmm. yes, longest running sitcom of all time. Correct. Right? Well, actually, I have to amend that. The longest running live action sitcom of all time because they were just surpassed by The Simpsons. And that's not fair because they're cartoons and they don't age. But wow. yes. 14, Longer than Happy Days? Yep. 14 Long and a half years, oh, wow. 435 episodes, which is- Longer than, longer than Seinfeld? Yes. Holy Absolutely. God. And it, it, it was an avalanche of episodes. And generations of Americans grew up with the Nelson family being their surrogate family, which they were all very proud of and they loved that. But a lot of people didn't know that Ozzy and Harriet originally met when Ozzy had a big band of his own in the tri-state area and he actually put out an ad for a singer and that's how he met Harriet. And as the story goes, the banter was funny between uh, their, their songs and they were very natural together. The banter got longer and longer. The songs got shorter and shorter. It kind of turned into more of a comedy routine with music than the other way around. They got caught by Red Skelton at one of the shows and he thought they'd be great on his, he had the biggest radio show at the time and he put them on as guests and the phones lit up and the network, which was ABC at the time, gave them their own radio show. And so for six years before the Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet television show, they did 400 radio episodes with completely different scripts that Ozzy wrote as well. Ozzy wrote, produced, edited, directed, and starred in all 435 episodes of the show. Oh and, uh, and before the show even started, he had a number one in 1935 with a song called And Then Some. Big band. Number hit. one song. Number one song. Then Warp Forward, when our dad started singing on the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, he had two number ones, which Another were Traveling Man and Poor Little Fool. Yep. Another and then, generation of number ones. Correct. With, with music that was 
too bad he was so ugly. My gosh, what a homely guy. <laughs> and All right, and I'm believing and the then, Elvis story more and more. The more you say it, I'm going to believe any Elvis story that yeah, you yeah. have going. And the, and then uh, warp forward to me and Matthew, um, the Sun Kissed Malibu Beach Twin, hot Swedish chick guys, and um, <laughs> Millie Vanilli scores a uh, or Millie Vanilla scores a, a, a hit with no, love and love and affection. And I can't live with, without your love and affection was unlike the other generations of Nelson. Uh, we wrote that, so we're pretty proud of that. But because of the three generations of number one hit makers, we are the only family in history with three generations to reach number one. And as a matter of fact, um, the song Poor Little Fool was the very first Billboard Hot 100 number one that came out with that chart. And that song was the first Hot 100 number one. And that, folks, is a fact. A Guinness Book of World Records fact, Vic. Fact. Fact. Thank you. I have to wait a little bit, I'll wait a little bit for the anima animation, but hey, you know what? It's time for us to do a really quick commercial break, and it's a special commercial break because it's just going to be me talking over a picture. So if you just hold on for one second there, our guest Gunnar Nelson is here uh, talking about all things past, present, and future, and of course we're going to dive into all the musical endeavors that he's getting into right now. A lot of touring for Nelson. Uh, there's your father's show uh ricky remembered we have to talk about that ricky nelson remembered and of course i'm going to talk a little bit about scrap metal as Sweet. well all right so let's uh let's see that picture vic huh what do you say because this is our big commercial it's ryan roxy all excess pass uh Friday. What does that mean? Well, we just kicked it off, folks. Leg two of the Alice Cooper tour uh, is kicking off literally in a couple weeks, like maybe 10 days from now. We'll be hitting all over Europe. And what better way to get all access and all access than uh, going to that website right there, ryanroxy.com, all access pass, and checking out all the things you will have, all the behind the scenes look. Oh, yes, it's a plug, boy. It's a plug because um, we just kicked it off this week and Totally impressed, amazed, and thankful for all your support. Everybody that's in the RGA, everybody's in the ITT, that stands for Roxy Guitar Army, and the In the Trenches Bunch. And, of course, you are not all, all accessors. So, there you go. There's our little plug uh, for all access. Uh, Vic will be running by with that... Uh, link of course and we've got federica standing by she can put up the link as well in the comments if you can and uh yeah hopefully you'll all go by and check it out but we are sitting here right now with mr gunner nelson from norway i will say norway why not uh, and because you know what never let the truth get in the way of a good story never let the truth get in the way and here it is is it true that the song can't live without your love and affection which we were just talking about was based on a crush on Cindy Crawford. Yep, she's the one that started it all. There you go. She's it's the one that started fact. it all. It's another fact. It is a fact. Matt was, uh, we were doing our writing thing, and we went through a whole phase for three years. That's all we did was write songs every single day for the first Nelson record. And uh, I was in the kitchen, and I heard this really cool 12-string uh, riff coming from down the hall. And back in that day, the height of technology was the micro cassette recorder little analog. Oh, yeah. I know thing. those little cassettes. I have a, yeah. a ton of ideas, a ton I've, of ideas on those. A lot of ideas that will never be delved into because they're in a dead format. But at the time I had my little micro cassette recorder to get my ideas down. Fortunately, I had it on me in the kitchen. I hit record. And by the time I got back into the room to ask him what he was playing, I saw him, he was sitting on the floor Indian style and he was kind of like playing his guitar, noodling and looking at an article on Cindy Crawford. And he had kind of gone into that zone and I broke him out of his trance. And he said, what do you want? I said, well, what was that you're playing? He goes, what, what are you talking about? I said, what you were just playing? What were you playing? That was really he cool. He was said, channeling Cindy Crawford. And he, said, I don't he, said, he literally didn't remember it. And I had, you the, had taped it. I had taped it. And that was the uh, beginning of love and affection. That's that, that part. I love that. I mean, it's work for it. I got, I got to continue that story because go for it. Okay. two and a half years later, We've already recorded the record. We're out on tour and we're out on our headlining tour. You mentioned you saw us with Enough's Enough, which was a lot of fun. It was on that tour right around that time, as a matter of fact. And uh, one of our crew guys, we were on a big bus tour and stuff. One of our crew guys comes back and and he's like really kind of acting weird, like he's either ashamed or nervous or something. And he said, uh, Matt, I, I um, you need to come to the office right now and take a phone call. And he said, uh, who's on the phone? And he said, believe it or not, it's Cindy Crawford. 
And he said, okay. And he went, went down the hall. Now these guys didn't know that Matt and Cindy had met at the rock and jock softball game and uh, for MTV and they'd run into each other. And I totally embarrassed them. I said, D- dude wrote a, wrote a number one song about you. Isn't that worth a kiss at least or something? And uh, you know, she, she sniped back at me. She was pretty sharp. And, uh, and apparently Cindy, it might have given Cindy the, the, the office of the production line and she had called uh, the production office and they had given her so much crap because they thought it was some not fan. Not believing it her. Yeah. Not right. And it was it actually her. really Cindy. And when they, when they real, I mean, they, they say, you know, how's Richard and cause she was with Richard Gere at the time. How's Richard and his gerbils or whatever that she was you know, being idiots. Right. Yeah. And, and giving her a whole bunch of crap. And, and, uh, and she got, she was just, she had a great sense of humor. She was laughing about the whole thing. I mean, my gosh, what a beautiful woman. There she like, is. L- look at her, just absolutely beautiful. But um, no, Matt actually really did know Cindy and got to know her from writing the song. And she was very, very sweet and very cool. They, they never wound up being romantically together, but they were friends. And then she went off and had a life and so did he and, and all that. But that song actually did get Matt to become friends with Cindy Wait, who inspired it from a, a, a huge distance. Well, see, I, I've written a few songs over the years in, in, in that same sort of tribute way. One was called The Ballad of Sandra Bullock. Ah. And another one was called Candy Loving, which I don't know if you if Candy Loving means Brother, anything to you. I'm a, I'm a, come on, I'm a creature of the 70s and 80s. Yes. I mean, every, who, 1979, who know Candy 1979, uh-huh. Playboy's 25th anniversary playmate, and there you go, Candy Loving. So it's funny because I just she did had a huge. Eyes. What? Eyes, huge eyes, eyes, eyes. yeah. Huge. It was all about the eyes, honestly. Big glasses, Candy Loving. Man. Big. I, I know that Vic Schauff on our producer is furiously combing through the internet of pictures of Candy Loving. I know Candy he Loving is. was stunning, you know. Look, well, I, and so is Sandra Bullock. But anyway, the true. thing is, you know, I just haven't become friends with either of them, and that's fine because you know, if I do, then I'm going to, you know, my wife's gonna open the door any second. I know you're talking about. You're talking about candy again. Well, you know, as a musician, the way I look at it is like like a normal guy who doesn't play music. It's our version of making a mixtape for somebody he's got a crush on. That's all it is. Explain that. There's candy. Huge. (laughs) All right. So everybody go listen to Candy Loving afterwards. And of course, you're going to have to go listen to Love and Affection right after. And you're going to think of Candy Loving and Cindy Crawford. There you go. Facts. I love it. (laughs) you know, you've probably been asked every stupid question about being a twin and I'm just going to continue the trend. And I guess, uh, but why is it, have you guys never publicly dated twins? Like why wouldn't Nelson date the Olsen twins and be really weird? Well, or did it happen? We don't really, we, we don't really did it roll. ever happen? Well, no, we don't really roll that way. As a matter of fact, I did date twins, but I dated both of them. Ah, <laughs> So uh, really, I don't, rec- I don't recommend it. It was a very difficult relationship, to be honest with you. It was pretty tough. I mean, people would think, "Oh my gosh, it's amazing." But I thought you could always just cover for each other and stuff. That's the way yeah, I thought. Yeah, you it know, would be. It kind of look. One of these days, Ryan, there there will be a book. I'm going to have to change every freaking name in the book. But <laughs> there was a time before cell phones when you had culpable oh, yeah. deniability. You didn't have instant access, and you couldn't be uh, revealed and stuff. I mean, once upon a time, I could blame being somewhere or with someone on my twin and no one would know. And I can't really do that anymore. I love it. Well, something happened. You moved out of Los Angeles. You moved out of Sin City and you 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 made the trek and you made the pilgrimage to Nashville Uh huh. Uh, early on. I yeah. would say even earlier than the boys in Cinderella. I oh, would yeah. say even earlier on than uh, Chuck Garrick, who, who is yep. our bass player. And uh, and he actually wanted to know, he was like, where does he live? I think we're neighbors. And they Yeah, go, I live in Franklin. You can tell him I live in Franklin. Okay. And uh, I, I love you're, it out you're here. You're Gibson. I actually, yeah, I, uh, I actually told, um, shoot, I told Mark Slaughter about Nashville. He's here now. He's wonderful. What One of my best friends. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Tom lives here as well, as you mentioned. So many people. Kip lives here. Um, Paul Taylor. Paul Taylor, yeah, and, and I think a lot of people were attracted to it because LA or Nashville, especially like five years ago, was like LA used to be when we were all growing up. It was so musical, and it, it was like one of these things. Like Los Angeles, it's all about TV and film, and the that the businesses that support the TV and film industry is Los Angeles. So if you go into a restaurant, your server, chances are they're writing a screenplay or they're taking acting classes or whatever. Yeah, Here in yeah. Nashville. 
it's all about music. Everyone is involved somehow in the music business. And it's not just country. Um, country is one of them. This is the hub for Christian music and contemporary Christian. Uh, there's a big rock scene, you know, coming out of here. I think the guys oh, yeah. in, in Fountains of Wayne are from are from here and bowling. For our our, all our boys in uh, in the uh, that we just got off tour with with the Ace Fraley band with Ryan Cook, Jeremy Asbrook, uh, you know, they, they're all from there as well. Yeah. So, you well, know. there's no state tax, shouts. no state tax, which is wonderful. You know, coming from Los Angeles in California in general. I really honestly don't know how people can afford to live. Anyone can afford to live in Los Angeles or California now. It's yeah, it's yeah. so ridiculous as far as the cost of living when you're spending eight or nine bucks a gallon on gas. I just don't, and, and you're dr in a driving culture. In Los Angeles, you have to have a car. You have to right. be able to get around. I don't know how they do it. And here in Nashville, it's just, it's kind of wonderful because when you walk into a, a situation and someone asks you what you do and you say, I'm a songwriter, they don't look at you like you've got six heads because they're mm -hmm. people who earn a living writing songs. And it's kind of nice being in a community where you don't feel like you're kind of swimming against the current all the time. Like people get right. you and what you're trying to do. And with the different styles of music here, it, it makes it very creative. If you want to collaborate, you know, look, I'm, I'm a, a rock guy, but I can collaborate with a country guy or a contemporary Christian guy and, and put something together that I wouldn't be able to put together on my own necessarily. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to find a commercial home or not, but again, I'm a writer who's just in, in pursuit of a great song. So I really don't care where it comes from as long as the end result is awesome. Yep. Unfortunately, I think you can't afford to live in L.A. if you live in a tent these days. Yeah. That's the I, only I, way. That's, that's basically and, and the they, only way. And they won't move you from the front lawn of somebody who spent all the money in Homeby Hills, you know, to actually have that that house. So you have more rights right there. Yeah, so, you have more so, rights. Absolutely. Uh, so if, if you're endorsed by Coleman, folks, um, right. is, is that a good tent company, I think? I don't uh, know. There's yes, probably better and, tent and companies. I grew up with Coleman. And Coleman and, yes, right. <laughs> so you're in Nashville. And you come from a long line of musicians. Uh, are your children musicians too? Because I know that you have three no, daughters. No, I've, I've, got, I've got three daughters and they're absolutely yeah. wonderful. Um, my youngest daughter, Asia, plays piano very, very well. And she's always been really attracted to music. And so um, if she weren't so bright, I mean, she's got the kind of mind I don't have. I'm not mathematically inclined. And I don't know where she got it from, but Asia is like this science and math genius and you would never be able to tell she's a very pretty person and all that stuff but her brain is kind of a next level brain so i have a feeling she's going to go down the you know being a, a doctor or a, or a researcher or something like that i think that's what she's going to do but uh can't she you plays, just write one number one song for her so you can continue the lineage of may, maybe song? well matthew's got a little boy who's eight and his name is ozzy so Okay. You know, Oz, Ozzy loves making music, so if he buckles down, who knows? It might be four generations. You never know. Four generations of number one, that'll put you in GOAT status, and that'll sort of be like Tom Brady status, where no one's going to touch your record after that. I got to work on it. It'll be very hard. I'm gonna, the girls are going to come home from school today. I'm going to turn the thumb screws and say, you will, yeah. you will come up with a number one song. <laughs> and then you will do my taxes afterwards. That's right. Very much. <laughs> Which you don't pay any because you live in Nashville. Perfect. Oh, it's, it's, like, it's like getting a year every 10 years for free. Guess what, Gunnar Nelson? It's time for the main event. Is Vic ready for the animation on this one? It's oh, no. time for the main event. Are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event. Wow, that was really loud, Vic. We have to remix that, I think. maybe. Um, I love we'll the get... production value, man. The production value is amazing on your show. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. You know what? You would have really loved it last week, and it was just me and Federock and and basically us, you know, fumbling around like, what the hell's going on? Because Vic was busy doing a thing called J O B, like a real job he was having to do. So not fun like this. Not fun like hanging out with you, Gunnar Nelson. And I know okay. you're doing a lot of these. Um, you're doing um, one of the podcasts. Uh, I think it's coming up just shortly is with my buddy, Stefan Adika. You're doing a vinyl uh, thing. I think you might've already taped it or something ha is happening. Yeah. So, we, we, I'm going to actually be going vinyl back challenge, on that right? show. Yeah. You're I'm going, going, going up, back, back on, on the, the show and doing the vinyl challenge. And okay, I'm looking forward cool. to that. Yeah. So uh, because it was Stefan that I went to that show with, and I, I must clarify the first time I saw you, I didn't actually see you because it was Stefan. And I believe my buddy, Steve West drummer of danger, danger uh -huh. who brought me there. And he said, Hey man, you got to check out 
these you know these guys man they're nelson they're really cool dudes and and they got this cool band called enough's enough that's opening man they're very cool and 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 so we went out there and we went all the way up there the only thing is that steve didn't have a plus one he didn't oh. even have he didn't even have a plus. He was just dropping his danger danger name, which he usually got him everywhere. So we ended up listening to the show right outside the door. Dude, but it sounded. Dude, I'm I so know. sorry. I'm 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 ashamed. You can't go of back in story. time. That's horrible. You can't I, go back in time. No, I had it's a similar right. story. Like I mean, I I, I was really uh, very good about that. I I, I hated um, when I was going to shows. If someone said, "Yeah, I'll leave a ticket for you and a, and a backstage pass." I mean, I took that really seriously. I thought, oh, this is really great. But there's no feeling worse than showing up to a place and not having your tickets and passes waiting for you. Or if you do have a pass, the sticky pass, the after show oh. only pass is the musical equivalent to the kick me sign. <laughs> and and, and I, I gave John Bon Jovi a little, a little bit of shit when, when uh, he and I were hanging out years later. When I was starting up, I was spending a lot of time in Jersey with my friend Jack Ponte. We were going to a lot of shows. Jack was in a high school band in Sayreville with John called The Next. And uh, I was told by Jack, who we were writing with at the time, this is before anything, before we got signed or anything. Yeah. Um, he's, John's playing Irvine Meadows, and this was on the Slippery Tour. So this is a big deal, right? So uh, I talked to John. John has a ticket for you and, and, and backstage passes for you and your brother waiting at Irvine Meadows at the Will Call. We were stoked, man. It's like, awesome you know went to the show what drove all the way down from studio city to irvine meadows through the traffic the place was bouncing off the walls i mean not an empty seat in a, in a place this titanic <laughs> tour go up to will call tickets weren't there uh -oh. i spent four-fifths of the show making phone calls to jack who was making phone calls to the production office uh -huh. and all that stuff that's where it all started listening to the bon jovi show in the parking lot by the will call booth and not being able to see the show. So when you told me your story, that was the moment yeah. that came back to me. And that's, oh, I'm sorry, hey, man. So that's where it all started with Jack and, 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 and Jovi, huh? Yeah. Jack and Jovi. Maybe you were the one you Jack were the one, Jovi. you were the instigator. It all started from, from Jovi, not putting the, the Nelson guys I, I, on I the a list. Mental note. In a serious thing. I made a mental note. Anytime I've ever promised tickets, and passes waiting for people i make sure personally that those tickets and passes are always waiting and if it's even a question that it's going to get messed up i give them my cell phone number personally call me yeah. backstage I'll, I'll work it out for you because i remember that feeling i grew up loving music and wanting to go to shows and doing all that stuff and and i kind of made a mental note that i wanted to do it differently i, I never wanted anybody to feel that way because it's enough going to shows i'm going to shows is a pain in the butt anyways you know and you're a kid and you're all caught up in a moment and you want to do it and all that stuff. You can't be let down that way, you know? And, oh, by and the, the way. Feud. Here's, 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 Started here's by the, the Nelsons. The feud between the... Ponte and Bon Jovi no, lives no, no. on to this day. The, 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 lives the, on. the punctuation mark on that sentence is that when I did get the tickets, which I did, they finally arrived. Oh, they did. Okay, they okay. They finally arrived. They finally did. Thank you, good night. I think they had like two songs left, maybe, <laughs> okay? We got in. And then we opened up the envelope with the passes. After show only passes. <laughs> Stickies. Ooh, Stickies. Oh my god! All, you, and you were you were expecting all access? Well, you know, like like this is a scene in Wayne's World when they're showing their passes around mm -hmm. and doing the whole mm -hmm. thing, you mm -hmm. know. And mm -hmm. and they they talked to Alice. They weren't worthy, and all this no. stuff. It was that classic scene, and and that was where it was where they had the after show only passes and stuff like that, and they show up and. You know, there, there are a couple of girls who are too big for their spandex and they're overflowing and a couple of, of, of weird looking radio guys and all that stuff and some finger foods and the band's nowhere around. You're not seeing, you're not meeting anybody, you know, just, no, it no, is, no. it is what it is, but, uh, now nah, you got to treat people well. It, it, it's a, it's a, it's a little slap. It's a little slap in the face, <laughs> just, but, just but a, you know what? In the dot, just a little bit. I got to be honest with you the, and the Alice Cooper organization, uh, if you get an after show pass, that's like a, a, a nugget of gold. It's like a gold currency because there is no laminates being given out. Sure. Hardly ever. Sure. So so an after show pass is, is, is as good as gold in our camp. But I, I understand it in, in other circles, other camps. I mean, when I go to see Kiss or something like that, everybody gets – you get a laminate. You get a – everybody gets a laminate. It's not about That's the like, laminate. It's about the band 
showing up. That's I, I didn't make that clear. Like usually okay. when when because I'm sure with you guys you actually go and you meet people after, after the show. show we do. We, okay. Well, when when we could we haven't now for what two to the last two tour cycles. I mean I don't know how it's going for you when you guys go on tours. Are you guys back to doing meet and greets? Oh, absolutely. We're we're afraid of nothing, dude. Afraid of nothing. <laughs> Afraid of nothing. You. you live in Nashville. I forgot. No, no, no. Afraid of nothing. No, no one's going to keep me away from fans anymore. For two years, our government kept me away from doing what we were born to do, which is ministering to people when they're feeling troubled or insecure or scared. I wasn't able to do. I'm supposed to be the guy playing violin on the deck of the Titanic when it's going down to make everybody feel better about it. That That's true. my job. That true. And I wasn't able to do that. And no one's going to keep me from doing that again. You know, had it recovered. I'm done good bob's your uncle if you're scared don't go to a show if you're not scared come get a hug god damn it i love it you, you know you have such a nice way of saying it it's it seems it seems unlawful that we haven't been able to tour now oh it, it, well i mean are you kidding me and that was for a reason right because it was designed that way music musicians we're in the connection business brother that's what we do I we make it. people oh. feel good we, we lift their spirits Let's but, talk about these connections. Let's talk about all the different types of music and stuff that you guys are doing to make those connections everywhere. Because sure. rock and roll, you got Nelson. Country, which is a whole nother type of music and a whole, you know, it's, it's all guitar driven. I'll give you mm -hmm. that. But you have Nelson Brothers. Tribute, you have Ricky Nelson Remembered. Uh -huh. Scrap metal, it goes even, even more into the point of playing tribute in, in, in celebrating the the rock and roll legends of past what's your favorite to play or do you like it all well i, I like them all for different reasons you know I, playing country music actually starting out doing the ricky nelson remembered show our dad had a legendary guitar player by the name of james burton who's still around and still playing amazing telecaster just he's like the godfather of rock guitar and he's uh, uh, amazing so learning that show it made me a, a much better guitar player all around because you can't really fake it you know when you're playing rock as you know, I mean, you can you can turn up the gain on an amplifier and you can get away with a lot. You know, play fast, you can get away with a lot. You can actually get away with some sloppy playing. But when you're actually playing um, through a, a clean Fender amp and Fender a Telecaster, amp, yeah. man, that reveals all. There's no way to hide behind that. And uh, that technique's pretty specific. So that that's made me uh, a better musician overall. But going out and playing scrap metal dates, which for your viewers out there, is uh, kind of best described as, um, well, that's a live mixtape of your favorite 80s and 90s rock stars in one place. So, uh, for example, it's the lead singers from all of the bands from the 80s that were mainstays of MTV and the, the hits sung by those original singers. Uh, the last gig that we did was Kip Winger, Mark Slaughter, me and Matt from Nelson, Lita Ford, and Dee Snider from Twisted Sister. That's a great so, lineup. Yeah, so when you, when you actually go to a show... Um, not too scrappy. Uh, not too scrappy, Gunner. But, but when you go to a show, you're getting hits that you know all the words to, sung by the original people that sang them, and backed by the same... By all of us who take it all really yeah. seriously. But, yeah. but our payoff, like, logistically, Ryan, it's, a, na it's, a, it's a, a nightmare because I have to coordinate. I'm the guy. I'm the, coordinate, uh, the quarterback of it. I have to deal with schedules and managers and agents and all that stuff for everybody. But the payoff is, on any given scrap metal show, for a moment, I get to be the guitar player in Slaughter. Right. I get to pretend to be Reb Beach. I get in to Winger. be in Lita's band in Winger. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get to do that. So, you know, you know how it is when you go out on tour and you're with one act, you're doing pretty much the same set. And if you're not careful as a musician, your groove can become a rut. You can fall into this thing where you're, you know, you're enjoying it, don't get me wrong, but you're doing the same stuff, really. You're not really having to push yourself. And that's kind of cool. But when you're having to learn new material that you don't yeah. normally play, and because you're doing it with the real, with the OGs, you have yeah, to yeah. do it note for note. You got to take yeah. it seriously. It, 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 it keeps you sharp. And I love that. I, I love the sensation of the whole thing. So you're in a cover band with the original singer. Correct. So is I that a cover it. band or is it not? It's not. It, well, I'm in, a, in, that, in that sense, I'm in a cover band with the original singer. Yeah, exactly right. So, and, and, and it's the same it. sort of thing because I, I I learned so many different eras of Alice Cooper's on the band does you know the band does a great job of learning you know seventies, eighties, nineties, two thousands versions of of different lineups that Alice has had over the years. So yeah, right. we're essentially 
We're scrap metal. Well, you are. But imagine <laughs> having to do that every show. You're going back to the drawing board because the cast of scrap metal is a revolving door. It's based on who's available. So it changes all the time. Okay. So you've got new people coming in all the time. The coolest thing, man, we did a, a gig um, a, a couple a couple of years back, and we had Barry Goudreau from Boston. And Barry actually was the guy who played all the guitar parts. It wasn't Tom Schultz. Tom was the B3 player. Everybody wow. thought, everybody thought, including me, because I'm a huge Boston fan, the yeah, that, that, now, that, now I'm going to give you a tiny bit of pushback. All those amazing solos is long time, uh, more That's than Barry. a feeling. Barry. Come on. Barry. Wow. It was Barry. I heard it from the horse's mouth. I, when I was playing with, with Barry, we did a couple of shows with him, and, and we'll continue to do them. But no, that was Barry doing it. And I actually asked John Boylan, who's my godfather, he actually produced the first Boston record with Tom. He's got the credit. He's he manages Linda Ronstadt and all that stuff. He's a legendary producer. But uh, John was there through the whole thing. He said, "Oh yeah, that was Barry." Maybe maybe it's a little bit of like when your your perception is like with Aerosmith. You're thinking that Joe Perry does all these great cool leads, and he does. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. at the same time, Brad Whitford does a lot of the cool stuff as well. Brad, so maybe the quietly, stuff, maybe the the stuff guy, that you were. Yeah. A lot of the parts that were the hook parts that you think Joe was doing is actually not maybe Joe. that's Brad. Yeah. yeah. And, and but, that but was the Boston really... Berry thing, I've never heard. I, I had never heard that before because I just assumed, right? Everybody... I assumed the guy MIT. Yep. He's got the, you know, he's got a rock man. Of course yep. he does. He looks cool in a jumpsuit, a white jumpsuit. You know, he how worked... many people can pull that off besides well, yeah, Justin well, Hawkins? Young from Sticks apparently can, but that's okay. a different era, They're a different story. But uh, <laughs> not but... in 2022, though. <laughs> no, no, to no, totally <laughs> true. Uh, I mean, last time I, I did a gig with Tom, we we actually got to Nelson got to play with Boston, which was really cool. And uh, and uh, Tom went out on stage in some cargo shorts and a in a tank top, you know. Um, was he was very relaxed, let's say. Yes, yes, he was, that's it. <laughs> he was very relaxed, but they sounded great. Um, they they really did. But when we played, it was really apparent when you play the Boston stuff with scrap metal, and you know Barry's playing the guitar parts. It's all in the it's all in the left hand, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. he could play through anything. It's like George Lynch playing through something. George Lynch could play through anything and he'd sound like George Lynch. When it. Barry when Barry plays through something, he doesn't necessarily have to be on an SG to sound like Boston, but mm -hmm. it's how it's Boston. You know, you can tell. We've reached our quota of George Lynch references per podcast. So I kindly ask that you don't mention him anymore because we do have a quota. Okay. And the, yeah. So thank you very much for that. Okay. Um <laughs> I love George Lynch. All of a sudden, there's a beef between me and George Lynch. He's a great player. What are you talking? Do you think Warren D D. Martini would be the guitar player he is if there wasn't George Lynch? Well, I mean, think the... about that era. That was that was during the era where everybody's guitar player could beat the other guy's guitar player up. I mean, they had such amazing. Starting with Randy, of course, doing his thing. Uh, George was doing his thing. Uh, it, it, Warren was doing his thing. You had Jake coming up after that. All out of California. Yeah. It was pretty crazy. You know, these Jake guys. Lee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were talking about all those guys with, and you know what? One of those guys in the mix, but kind of like under the radar because he was East Coast, but uh, it was Richie Rano from yep. Star. Yeah. All those guys loved, all those guys loved Stars. You That's know, I used cool. to ride Harleys with Doug Aldrich, amazing guitar player. Dougie you know? Aldrich. I love yeah. it. Yes, Nicest yes. guy in the world. And what a player, you know, because um, House of Lords actually went out on tour with us, with Nelson, the first go round. Before Enough's Enough joined the tour, it was House of Lords, and he was playing with House of Lords. Okay, okay. See, I I, I toured with, uh, was it Doug, when in Hurricane? Oh, wow. Or yeah, was it Hurricane the, or Lion? Which one was he? No, it was, it was definitely Hurricane. It was Electric Angels and Hurricane across. Because, I, because that was the first two tours I ever did as a guitar player. Talk about being thrown into the fire. Um, and, and, and it's like... You take it as a challenge, but damn, it's intimidating. First band that we went on tour was with Danger Danger. So Andy Timmons was the Amazing. guitar player in yeah. that band. And, and and then yeah. the second is Hurricane. Yeah. And, it's, and there you go. There's a yeah. little Danger Danger reference. We love that. We never have enough Danger Danger references in a podcast. There is no quota. You just keep quoting Danger Danger. Well, Ted Poley have... is actually a, a cast member for Scrap Metal. He's done, he's done gigs with us. So he's, and he's wonderful. It all works. Is, yeah. is there any guitar player that intimidates you or inspires you, uh, you know, or, or do they all intimidate and inspire you? Well, yeah, no, look, I, I'm just, again, I'm a drummer who wants 30% more chicks. So I play guitar my way. You know, I, I make it work 
and stuff. And I have a very particular sound. I was, uh, you know, I had an accident when I was a kid. So um, I don't have use of my pinky and all my fretting hands. So all my chord shapes and stuff are made with these three fingers. So, um, okay. yeah. So, wow. so, my, so, so, so wait a second, you, you, you've never utilized I, that pinky. I can't, there's no tendon in it. So if you oh. look at the difference in the size between pinkies, this, this is no one's home. So, all right, all right. but wow. uh, yeah, it's okay. I, that, I that's probably something that you do. Do you share that a lot with people? No, not really, but they see me play and it looks like I've got manners when I'm playing that my little pinky sticking out in the middle of nowhere. But, uh, <laughs> But you know, the, the players, you feel comfortable I, enough to share it with me. Of course, this is, I, I feel that we've made a breakthrough here today because I didn't know about a couple things. I didn't know that Colonel Parker did have. Thank you. I am William Shatner oh, of I love the podcast the era. <laughs> love the tribbles. But but I, I'm I'm happy to to uh, that you have because I've, I've all morning literally I've watched I've gotten uh, this really weird rabbit hole. I went down uh, Instagram site called Kids Hurting Themselves. Because no, it's not right. I know it's it's not right to do, but I, I got to call out Nita Strauss, um, our guitar player, because she sent these this thing, uh, this these videos today, and I, I must actually just show. <laughs> I can't believe I'm calling out Nita for this, but it's true because um, we have a band chat. And then she said, uh, you have to like check this out because basically um, kids getting hurt on Instagram. And, and here you go. There's things like this. People falling. Now you've seen these, of course. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, so basically I want to hear a little bit about your, um, about your sort of uh, injury that was able to, you know, now you're becoming a guitar player because of it. What was, what childhood injury was it? And why was well, it? Uh, it was back in the day, Matt and I were probably seven or so and the world was Kung Fu fighting, you know, it was either Chuck Norris or Bruce Lee and, uh, their movies were really big. So back Everybody in that was day, Kung Fu fighting. there yeah. was even a song about it, man. Yeah, there what was. Talking about? <laughs> there was. And, 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 and martial arts was a really big deal. So Matthew and I, uh, we enrolled in Chuck Norris's karate school and stuff. And we, you know, probably we just, really Chuck Norris. Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It was his, it was of his course dojo. It was. It was that his, was a, that was a fortunate beginnings. Those yeah. were fortunate beginnings. And, and, and so Matt and I would wrestle around and, and throw kicks and punches at each other and all that stuff, just scooting around. And he threw a sidekick at me, just, playing around at home and I went to go block it and I hit it. I, I blocked it completely incorrectly and I hit it right at the wrong angle. And I didn't know that I had actually just taken the tendon off of my finger and it like a rubber band went right through all of my, my arm and stuff. It was my forearm was burning and, and I didn't know what it was. And as a kid, I didn't want to get into trouble. And so I didn't tell my parents and all that. And Until what, 1970 something. Well, by, by the time I'd actually talked to somebody about it, um, it, it, it was too late because they just said the rehabilitation for at this point w would have been yeah. so long and so painful. Would it really be worth it? And, and to be honest with you, look, it'd be really nice to be able to play some of the leads. I mean, I love Eric Johnson's playing, you know, when I, when I was coming up and I heard Avia Mus Musicom and Cliffs of Dover and things like that, I would listen to that kind of playing and go, gosh, it'd be so neat to be able to do something like that. And I physically can't do something like that. Um, I can't but do it, all of this. It, but it doesn't affect your drumming. No, it, it didn't affect my drumming at the time. But for some reason, I, I always had this, this feeling that I was going to actually have to learn how to play guitar because I started out writing songs. And it was so frustrating to sit, sit there, hear something in my head, even as a kid, and try to hum it to somebody who was playing guitar with me what I wanted them to do. I was getting frustrated. And, uh, you know, Matt played four strings, so he couldn't even do chord shapes or you know, uh, minors, augmentations, anything like that. And, and I was hearing it. The only way for me to really express it was to learn it myself. And that's kind of how, how it all really started. Was, so was, first position chords for you are completely screwed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so, so I just so, do so, cheats. I do cheats. I, 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 I'm, I'm doing open tuning, stuff like that. Well, not, not, I wasn't even What are your cheats for, for all the three finger guitar players out there that are listening to our podcast, which we have a pretty big following of three yeah. finger guitar players. Um, what, what are some of the tricks of like playing those first position chords when you don't have use of your pinky? Okay. Well, uh, how can I show you? I don't um, know. Is there a guitar around? I can't see. I don't know. Do you have a guitar? <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's got every single beautiful. Just, 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 just one off the wall. Yeah. Okay. So how does somebody normally play a G chord? Okay. So that's, that's normally 
someone's normal yep. G chord. That's the fingering, right? Okay. My G chord is like that. Aha. So, so I, I just, you know, learned how to, rather than I'm, I'm missing, I'm missing that note in my G chords. So I'm faking it with third. a mute right here on the pad. Third. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's my G chord. Uh, my D position's all screwed up. That's, this is, that's my D position. It's all messed up. It's, it's reversed oh, yeah. from, what, oh, yeah. from, from what most people do. So I never took lessons. I just, I just kind of made it work. And uh, inversions actually really do help. You know, most people are playing in the first position and stuff like that. I, I'll have to, I'll have to work my way up the neck to get something that, that sounds kind of like it, but um, I've never let it really handicap me um, because I was never really an incredibly technical player, but I really admire the Nuno Betancourts and the yeah. Eric Johnsons and, the Brett Garsons in my band, that, that guy is just it's like the best guitar player I've ever worked with. I did hundreds of But the of perseverance shows. of you learning all those chords just without the use of your pinky, that's more hero stuff. That's like that's like overcoming stuff. Well, that's Django crazy. Reinhardt had the use of two fingers. Okay. Well, you know, that, that, I, mean, I mean, look him up from the 30s and uh, from the 20s and 30s. That guy was a jazz bow, but he was burning up and down that neck and he was in a fire when he was younger. And he only had use of uh, his index finger and his middle finger. And wow. he's blazing all over the place. So I had no excuses. I was all feeling right. sorry for myself. And I talked to Dave Weiderman at the Guitar Center once upon a time about, you know, I just, I'm having a really hard time learning how to play guitar. I can't, I can't get the, the, the left hand right. And then he turned me on to Django Reinhardt and I felt like a douche. So I stopped <laughs> complaining and just started making music. Well, if you want to learn how to play guitar and you want to be able to use your pinky, definitely come check out my website called the System 12 Guitar Method. And if you don't, and you just, you don't, you can't use your pinky, or you just don't really want to use your pinky, please go check out Gunnar Nelson's new guitar course. <laughs> you know what I did learn? Three though, is the is charm. That, you know what's really cool is that they do make a pinky slide. So I'm able to use that now. That's, you know, half the, the time I've got, a, I've got a slide on that finger, and uh, that works out just fine. Well, let's talk about where people can see, where people can find you, and uh, when you're going to be playing out now, because you are out on the road with all these different types of projects that you have going. Uh, Ricky Nelson Remembered is doing some um, shows coming up real soon. I thought I saw in Vegas, right? Yeah, we're, we're going to be at the, at the South Point coming up in Vegas, and uh, starting to get about, back. Yeah, tell us about the whole thing about Ricky uh, with, with Ricky Nelson Remembered. How did it come about, and uh, what 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 do, can people expect from the show? It's, it's best described as a high energy rock concert meets an A&E biography episode. It's like the history of rock and roll, you know, as told on video and stuff. And we play the music in and out of things and all that. It's, it's really cool. It's for, um, it's basically for any music fan. You don't necessarily need to be a Matt and Gunner fan or a Rick Nelson fan even, but you're going to get an education, but there's definitely going to be a spoonful of sugar with the medicine. Um, we, we approach it with the same kind of energy that our dad did. Uh, he was playing the early rockabilly stuff fiercely i mean the attitude was really definitely there he had that incredible guitar player and i i'm i'm honored to to play all the james burton guitar parts i'm a telly man so i Absolutely. get to go out and do that matt's an incredible bass player and got a great drummer so we go in lean and mean and we just we just burn it up but um one thing that you might not have on your cheat sheet there is we actually have a greatest hits record that's about to come out it's about to drop in about a month and oh, I have that, folks. That's coming up because it's a remastered edition, right? Or is that well, the remastered it's, it's, edition of After it, the Rain? No, no, no. That's already been out. That's that's for the uh, okay. collector grade vinyl. That's 180 gram vinyl, and that's the After the Rain record we did. Uh, we we did actually remaster that with Ted Jensen, and it was great. But no, we actually just did a deal with Universal, and Universal is biggest record company in the world. They actually inherited. They're kind of Universal, aren't they? Uh, yeah, they're kind of Universal. <laughs> Um, they actually bought Geffen Records. So all of the catalog on Geffen Records, which were our first two records, the After the Rain record and Because They Can, were on Geffen. But Matthew and I have our own independent label that we've had since 1993 called Stone Canyon Records. We've got 21 titles on that record, on that, on that label. It's the first time that we've been able to bring all of the material under one roof and pick the best material through our entire Nelson career on one album and it's called nelson greatest hits and near misses and it's 17 songs and uh and you're gonna hear I, a huge spectrum of music it, it, yes you are but you're gonna hear a through line through three decades of music and we're super proud of it ryan this the record's really good i know everybody's in love with the latest thing they've done but just as a as a music fan the fact that that, that we, we even get to talk about a greatest hits record which sounds incredibly pretentious 
is amazing to me because I'm a kid from Burbank who just wanted to make music, you know? Yeah, and, I, and I put out a box set before, you know, I put out a box set because I had three albums and four albums with, and a fourth album worth of unreleased stuff. Awesome. That's enough for a box set. Why it's not? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Anthology. So, Anthology, baby. Well, love it. Love it. So <laughs> so we just got that done. So I have a feeling there are going to be some more Nelson dates in the future. And and I, we got to talking before we got on, on uh, online here about our new project. It's called Firstborn Sons. And that's, okay. I, I'm also, so for the, the old stuff, we've got the Nelson greatest hits thing for the new stuff. The n- next chapter in our life is uh, called firstborn sons. And stylistically, it's like, it sounds like Walsh era Eagles meets Skinnerd, fronted by the Everly brothers. Wow. That's a great combination. All recorded in Nashville. Yeah. Well, all recorded in my studio downstairs. I, I have a, a state of the art studio here in my home. You have a state of the art uh, hangout room right there. What are you talking about? Is that- oh, this is this is our live room, which is uh, pretty groovy. You know, this is where yeah, we yeah. do all our rehearsals. And there and- it is. The lo- is that the logo already? It oh, has yeah, a that's, little. That's that's the logo back there. Oh man! All right. But um, the, the the music is really 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 that's cool. A little bit I'm, of the I'm- Outlaws vibe. The Outlaws vibe kind- logo. Yeah, well, kind of, kind of like that. I kind of ripped off the Marshall Tucker band logo, but don't a tell little me bit Marshall Tucker. No, no. Sh- yeah, sh- it'll be fine. It'll be fine. But we're having a great time doing it. You know, it's, um, uh, so, it's all so about that's, the that is, is that sort of something that, that isn't coming out right now? Because I know that you have dates already booked yeah. for, for Ricky Nelson Remembered in Vegas. And those are and you can go on to your, your official website, where we're just going to put up the links in just a second, where people can check that out. Um, you have scrap metal shows going. It's a, it's a revolving, you know, sort when, of... When they, there's like door. an event. When, when they can happen, they, can they can happen. happen. Yeah. Okay. And the, and so so this Nelson... And then, of course, you released... Uh, re you re-released the remastered version, the 180 gram and, and, and vinyl guys are going to go crazy because it weighs how many more grams than an average album? Or it, what's it's the... like three times as heavy and, and the, it, re- it really actually does sound better. It's the first time I've heard the After the Rain record with bass response in it. Um, okay. I think the guy who originally mastered After the Rain back in the day, let's just say they... I think they had some oh, chemical help at the time. Yeah, yes. Well, so, well he yeah. was uh, just pointing at his nose a lot. <laughs> yeah. Very, very, they were making very top, top end heavy records back then. Lots okay. of crunch, you know? I got it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. A lot of sizzle. A lot of, yeah. a lot of, I really like to call it sizzle. Yeah. There. <laughs> I can, but uh, yeah. now it sounds, now it sounds right and real, but we th- then went back in, uh, even with the four songs from the after the rain record that we included in this greatest hiss package. And we remastered them with Ted Jensen and, start to finish it sounds like a cohesive body of work that goes over 30 years and it's uh um, ted jensen is just one of those names that you see i always think of todd jensen because todd jensen is a is a friend of mine but played bass in alice cooper played uh-huh. you must know todd jensen as I well do. yeah uh-huh. uh, but ted jensen sounds like those uh, iconic names like george marino yes all, all of those classic yes. records we grew up with we would we would run home when there was such a thing as a record store we'd get that record out we'd put it on the turntable or put the cd on or whatever and they'd have some artwork and we'd go through it and you'd read who wrote everything and where it was recorded and all those, there was like a, a group of names of mastering guys. Marino was one of them. Jensen was another one. Yep. And, the, yep. and the studios, yeah, the Sterling Sound was in New York at the yep. time. They've now moved to Nashville. Well, there you go. Yeah. I love it. That was where I had a few of my records mastered at Sterling Sound. Sterling because Sound. Because of those early albums, those yep. early Cheap Trick records, those early Aerosmith records, it was always mastered by George Marino at Sterling Sound. I mean, I'm and, super uh, blessed with the, with Firstborn Sons. We've gotten a chance to work with Chris Lord Algae, who has made some of the best rock records in the history of rock. And I yep. was always a fan of Chris's engineering and stuff. So he does our final mixes. Um, I, I just got to work with Jack Joseph Puig for the first time and. That was a joy because the Jellyfish records are some of the greatest music I've Quig. ever heard. Quig is Quig. cool, cool whip, yeah. cool whip. Yeah, yeah. The, both those names, you know, Chris Lord, Algie, Jack Joseph, Quig, uh, mm-hmm. sounds they they are producers' names as much in the sense as Gunnar Nelson oh, is like a, reg- a guitar player in a rock band name, or you know, in sort of a country rock band or whatever band you're you are are sort of making it now. And what I want our folks to see right now is all the links, and you can tell them um, that are listening on the audio broadcast of where to find you. What's the best place to uh, get in touch with Gunnar we're, Nelson? We're on every social that, that you can imagine. Um, if you even want to just put in nelsontwins.com, it'll get you to to the Facebook and Twitter and and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of like the hub 
So if you want to remember anything, that's it. But we're on Twitter and Facebook, uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, the web, old school, and all that stuff. You can find us. It's pretty easy. Just, uh, just, just uh, put in your in your Google search Matthew Nelson, slightly better looking twin brother Gunner, and and we'll come up. <laughs> I like that you're look, you're searching for that algorithm. Um, I guess my my closing question, one of the more hardball question, is uh, uh when is the next uh, season of Celebrity Wife Swap coming, and are you part of it? I am not part of it, but you're, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know what's pretty cool about that 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 show. Um, I, I did my episode with my friend Vince, and oh, yeah. uh, Vince and, Neil. There yeah. he is. Look at that. Yeah, and that 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 was the swap that happened. So Vince had to move in now with four women, and you just had to move in with Rain. No, which no, is no, no, no. Actually, it's reversed. Rain actually moved in to my family with me and the girls. And okay. my wife, Lila, went to Vegas, where Vince was living at the time, got to hang out with Vince for a week. And the contrast, obviously, was, you know, I'm a family man and 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 have always been. But, uh, you know, Vince was living the rock star lifestyle with his girlfriend, Rain, out there in Vegas, very high paced yeah. life. Right. And so it was the contrast that we had, you know, eight years ago of how we were living our lives and stuff. But the interesting thing is um, Vince and Rain loved Nashville so much from doing that show and from being out here, they sold their place in Vegas and they've moved to Nashville. So they live about five miles away from me now. I love it. You changed lives, Gunner. You Hi, changed man. lives. No, no, think about it. Think about it. You started the feud between Jack Pawnee and John Bon Jovi by, by at some point by not getting them into, you know, by not you not I having a sticky pass. You might know, the, 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 I had nothing to do with their feud. <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think Jack needs much of an excuse to be <laughs> mad at anybody. To be honest with you, I don't think I helped or hurt. So, <laughs> all, right, all right, but you're still changing lives because you did actually maybe have a little bit of a positive influence of Vince Neil I, moving to I, Nashville, know, look, relocating. Look, Vince, you know people people uh, know of Vince from his music or from the internet or whatever. Here's a couple things I'm going to say about Vince in all seriousness. Yep. He is a genuinely good guy. He is a genuinely good person. We toured with him for for, for two and a half years, and and, yep. and, and you know what? Uh, I, I got to know him and Rain very well. Very, we always had a good time, and he was always very, very cordial to us, and always very you know, Vince, professional. Vince is a gentleman. He's also incredibly bright. He kind of rope dopes people in to think that he's just mm. so, you know some party guy, and he's not all that smart. Puts on Vince, the top Vince hat is a, and the hair in the face and sort of, yeah, okay. Don't underestimate Vince Neal's mind. He's a very, very smart person. And uh, he has always been very kind to me and Matthew. And and uh, and I'm grateful for that because, you know, come on. We come along. We look like Millie Vanilla back in the day. <laughs> and we were marketed by the record company and all the teen magazines and all this. And we were a lot. I get it. I mean, I, I get it. I understand it. But, um, you know, I was raised alongside Beatles. And I've always found that arrogance accompanies incompetence and, and the jerks I've met in the business so far were the ones that were the newbies or the ones that were hiding a lack of talent or ability and stuff behind ego. But the people who are really competent at what they do and very secure have always been incredibly sweet to me and Matthew. And, yeah. um, you know, I love the way you put it earlier. You said we were the last of the confidence rockers. Yeah. I love that term confidence yeah. rockers, baby. You know what? We were just, with with uh, back in that era, because I was in Electric Angels, we sold like maybe uh, you know a fraction. Like a, a, I don't think you can put enough zeros in the decimal point of how many records we sold compared to what Nelson sold. But we were both influenced by um, fashion, like like it, it sure. was flamboyant, right? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. and even though you guys had long, lustrous blonde hair, we had the same stuff opposite. We used the same amount of Aquanet that you guys did. Yeah, I, 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 I can guarantee that we did. Well, back in the day, look, if you didn't have long hair, you didn't get chicks. That's just the way it was, you know? So, okay, you grew out your hair and you did your thing. But with Nelson's image, this wasn't a record company fabrication. We kind of reasoned that, okay, kids sitting there and they're flipping through the channels. And if you're lucky, you've got a second to a second and a half to capture people's attention and make them park at least for a moment on the channel and, and kind of investigate what they're looking at. And so we that whole peacocking thing of of the color and the outrageous costumes and all that stuff was in pursuit of the, of the theory that love us or hate us, you're going to know who we are. It was our first record. 
And there was a lot of traffic out there, a lot of people we were competing with. So when most of the other blues oriented bands were doing their black and white warehouse, spill beer on your girlfriend's videos, that's not who Matt and I were. No. We were never that way. We were a couple of, you know, basically heavy folkies. And so we wanted to stand out from that crowd. You know what? It would have been easier on us had people told the truth and, and just been open about the fact that we wrote every song, that we produced the records in the case of After the Rain. I got to mix that song myself as a 19-year-old kid because yeah. everybody evaporated from the studio. And, you know, you just did what you needed to do. But the whole vision for Nelson you was, took control. was, yeah, was specifically like, hey, look, if this doesn't happen or if we go down in flames, at least we're going to do it our way. You know, right. that still makes you a success, whether or not it's commercially successful. If you are able to do things you know, following the vision that you've always had, you win no matter what. But if you listen to a record company guy and he goes, you know, you need to do so and so song and you need to look like this band and you needed to do this. Even if you're successful, you lose. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll cite the example of uh, Cheap Trick. My buddies in Cheap Trick. Love One those of my guys. favorite bands of all time. Yeah, we have, love Cheap Trick. They hate the flame. The Diane Warren song. <laughs> I, I'm flame. with you. I, I'm, I'm with you on that. It's not a Cheap Trick song. It was never no, a not. Cheap Trick song. And, and they probably don't think so. Big, giant, number one hit. Diane Warren yep. song. It sounds like a Diane Warren song. They needed the hit. They, were, they got talked into it by the record company. They got the hit. They never liked the song. And now they got to play it every damn night on stage. So to okay. me, as an example, I was like, I never want to be in that position where, you know, even when you l win, you kind of lose. Hmm. You know, I, I, yeah, I just always that. I just always like emotionally like, look, we've all released records that don't do as well as we'd hope. And then every now and again, you, you never know. Like, it's weird because every now and again, a song will catch fire that you just think is OK that you wrote. You, you, you feel you've written better. But the, but for some reason, the chicks like that one song and you don't know why it is. But, you know, you follow it. But at least that's your work. And, and right. I've been really blessed in the, in the fact that in uh, growing up in, in, uh, with Geffen and all that stuff, there were a lot of bands that were getting outside songs and they were trying to aim it for them at MTV or radio. Um, no one really messed with the fact that Matthew and I were always writers and always wrote our own material because we weren't generating any money at the time. We had no attention on us. And that was a blessing. You know, they had so many other bands that were priorities, like the, the priority band on Geffen at the time for the quarter, because for the viewers out there and the listeners, the record companies always pick one act every quarter to prioritize. Okay, if they have a whole stable of artists, they will have a marketing meeting and every quarter they will pick one band to put all their financial resources into and all their radio into and, and the radio favors and all that. Nelson was, ne was never the priority band at Geffen. Yeah. Little Caesar was the priority band at the yeah. time. Ron yeah, Young's band well. was, they did a, a cover of Chain of Fools and, and it was you know great and the video was great and all that. And Matthew and I lucked out. Daisy Fuentes at the time was going on vacation and our manager was able to get me and Matthew, a couple of unknowns at the time, to sit in for her on MTV and, and be VJs. And we did. We brought our acoustics along because the Milli Vanilli scandal had happened a year earlier. People saw us. They didn't think we were real. But we played in and out of commercial breaks and ripped up on each other and made fun of ourselves and did the whole thing. And that is what broke Nelson. Did you influence Adam Curry's haircut? No, Adam. Yeah, actually, are you another life changer or would he already no, have it? I he actually rocked him. It. Now, Vic can actually find this. When I did, uh, we did the American Music Awards in tribute to our father who had just passed. I had the world record mullet of all time, rivaled only by Richard Marks. It was pretty darn good. Oh you know? no! I saw a picture earlier on that Vic put up of, uh, of you know your father and the two of you. You guys were sporting some really good, almost, almost Dorothy Hamill esque mullets. We, well, we were growing out our hair <laughs> at the time, and then the, our hair took us over. There was nothing I could do about it. I was like Jordy Verrill, you know. I got I got overgrown with hair. What what could I say? <laughs> well, the thing is, I'm, I'm sure Vic is Vic combs the internet for Adam Curry uh, photos. Don't worry about it. I I do want to um, ask you because you have dropped there. You, you know, the only choice you've made a lot of decisions. I love that picture right there. The only decisions I wouldn't have made is the keyboard leather jacket. Well, you know what? I, I will know. Was a backstory about that? No. Well, yeah. <laughs> See, I commissioned the American flag jacket that I'm wearing. I had okay. a stylist that uh, we we got our first publishing deal. And we reinvested the money back into our trip. All that, it that all clothing went into that was, jacket? Yeah, the clothing was expensive. <laughs> now, what I was wearing, in contrast to the keyboard jacket, was something that I had designed 
for six months and my, my stylist was making it. It's full length sequence. It's let's stunning. go back to that. Let's go back to that picture. Oh, now Vic is okay. okay yeah. yeah. So, so I'm. Oh, the, I'm okay. I can see you. You okay. got a. You've got a John Parr meets uh, sort of Apollo Creed. You know, Rocky Two vibe, yeah, right? Well, now, what was really cool, and I didn't expect this. You know, Desert Shield had just become Desert Storm at the time, and it was the first conflict that we sent our boys and girls over to in decades. And and all our kids were really concerned about whether or not they were going to come back alive. And public sentiment at that time. Had not, no one had taken a, a, a stance on it at all. So Matthew and I, that picture is from us presenting at the American Music Awards. And we actually were able to present Garth Brooks with his, with his very first award ever. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so Matt and I go out there and the first thing that I said on mic at the American Music Awards uh, before we were presented was, I'd just like to send uh, some love out to our, our men and women who are overseas and just let you know that we miss and love you. We're praying for you. We want, we want you to come home safe and sound. I was wearing that jacket when I did it and I was doing it to make that statement. And then of course, all the presenters after that were like, Oh yeah, I'll load all the troops and all that stuff. But I was the guy. You were the first. And, the first. And, and that's why I was wearing that jacket. And Matthew, when it showed up from the stylist and he saw what I was going to wear, he kind of freaked out because he had nothing that could even kind of compete. So he went that. out and bought the first thing in New York city that you can get, which is a keyboard <laughs> leather jacket. At least it wasn't a, a keyboard necktie, but it was just close to a keyboard necktie. My, that, cause then that would have given more credit to Magatu. Yeah, that's right. that's that. right. Magatu invented it. He gets I all bloated it. and farty when you give him a creamy <laughs> latte. That's right. Wow. You know what I love? If you, if you really, I, I okay. Because not much has changed in our in our wardrobes. I mean, we still have jeans that are that that, that have holes in it. But um, what what are the the boot tips? If you go, and I say, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for detail because I, I yeah. have the same red red suede uh, shoes that you had. But it, what what do they call that? Is that the boot concho? Is well, you boot, know, it, uh, we we actually we we were crazy, man. We had, I mean, dude, we were wearing like chaps and we were wearing all kinds of stuff in the the cowboy <laughs> boots. There was definitely a, wanted to be American. Well, there was a store that was down no on Melrose. That. that was a, a wonderful store called Let It Rock. And our oh, friends Clive and Matto owned yeah. Let It Rock. And love they turned Let us It Rock. On, yeah, and they turned us on. They were a couple, a couple from England, and they were way ahead of their time. And so when we were doing our, our styling and stuff, they turned us on to a leather artist named Drew Whitefeather. And Drew was the guy back then with all of the hair, hair band guys. If you could afford Drew, he would make you – yeah. Uh, you know, leather bootstraps and, you know, fake spurs and boot tips and all that stuff. And he was a genius at that whole thing. I think Matt and I went a little overboard, but <laughs> you know what? We did get recognized. That's a thing, you know? Um, and we, and I, we bought, I bought it. You know what's funny? As I, I did remember buying a jacket from Let It Rock. It was a pink Letterman's jacket with leather, uh, with leather sleeves. I bought it off of Mick Cripps uh, from yeah. LA Guns because yeah, yeah, yeah. he worked there. Yeah, yes, he did. Remember? Mick worked there. That's right. <laughs> yes, he did. And, and that was the kind of the place to go. They, it, because they were from London, they had a, a, a direct contact with the people at La Rocca, and they were like two years ahead of fashion trends in the United States. So, uh, And also, too, they really embraced that whole 50s thing. The Stray Cats at the time had their first record out, and they totally changed the paradigm. They, they recorded with Dave Edmonds over in London. They brought that music back here, and it was a big thing. So you know, you had the rock thing that was brewing, the classic rock thing that was brewing, and the rockabilly resurgence that was going on at the time. And and uh, Let It Rock was a closed store on Melrose that sold to both crowds. Yeah, yeah, I I, I totally remember. I mean, when, when Electric Angels went to London to record our record, we recorded with Tony Visconti. We came, but when we were there, we went to all the markets. So when we came back to New York, we were about maybe six months ahead of the trend. And that's when we had all the scarves, yeah. the, vel the yeah. velvet and all that kind of stuff. And then it was like just a couple months later, then the London choir boys just went right. crazy and went nuts. And speaking of, Oh my God, man, you know what? I've, I've gone on, we've gone on this tangent. Gunner, we said we weren't going to do it, but we Brother, did it. You, know, you and I could uh, talk for weeks. You know that, right? And we will. You know okay. what? We're going to. We're, we're gonna, next time we meet up. We're we're going to obviously talk about what's going on with the greatest hits album, um, and 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 the release of it and the promo. The one thing I did want to ask you about it is: there going to be some new music that you accompany with it live, or yeah. what is happening with that? Yeah. Well, I mean, the 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 Nelson show that we're going to do is literally going to be the playlist from the greatest hits record. It's seventeen tunes. And I couldn't pick any better. So we're, we're actually from start to finish, including the sequencing, going to play that album. And I'm excited for that. But for, uh, for the stuff that we're really focusing on, Firstborn Sons, man, I'm going to have to float you some material because it's, it's kind of hard to describe music. It's like trying to describe the flavor of a food. 
and I'm a, an aspiring chef and I still can't really describe that. You have to experience it yourself. So I'll send you some material. You tell me what you think. We're, we're definitely creating our very own category yeah. and, and all that stuff. It's again, guitar driven, unapologetic, very American music. So firstborn sons, that's what we can all look forward to yep. as well. Um, you know what? I, I I have gone on for a long time today, but the, something very special. One little announcement that I wanted to make is our fan of the week. And uh, Vic, if you're ready for that, let's just do a quick fan of the week, and then we'll close out with Gunnar Nelson. And folks, you have been amazing in the chat all single every single time. I see all your comments. Uh, we've gone on from a few tangents. We started from at amusement parks. We ended out on Melrose, and somewhere in between, there was some sort of talk of a leather, red, white, and blue keyboard. Jacket. You're right. Here is fan of the week. <laughs> Folks, every single week uh, we have a fan of the week. This one's very special. Jurgen Helwig, you are a fan of the week in Germany. And guess what? Because you have been supporting us not only with all things in the trenches, all things Roxy Guitar Army. You also have been uh, supporting with the All Accessors. You are the winner. You are the winner of the Ryan Roxy Guitar Jersey giveaway. So there you go. Jurgen, this was all yours, folks. This hockey jersey is all yours. Uh, Gunner, are you into sports? Are you into hockey right now? I know the playoffs are happening. I know NBA is happening. I mean, the NFL. What sport is your you're into fishing. Well, okay. uh, I'm, I'm actually kind of into football, to be honest with you. My my grandfather, Tom, football. won the Heisman Trophy at Michigan in 1940. And oh, dude, uh, Alice is going to love you. He's he's a big blue guy, right? Isn't oh, that, yeah. Isn't that, is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, so wait, knows who, he, he knows who Tom Harmon of Michigan is. He definitely does. Okay. What, yeah. what year was that? 1940. 1940. Wow. 19, okay. With, there were, there with were like, only two guys. There were only two guys who ever, ever got the Heisman out of Michigan, and and my grandfather was one of them. And then my uncle Mark, uh, before he became Gib, Gibbs on NCIS, was the starting quarterback for UCLA. Holy shit! So you do come from? It's not just rock royalty. Like I said, it's just entertainment royalty. Yeah. Well, there's well until Mark actually started acting. Yes. So there's uh, sports on my mom's side of the family, and then I, uh, I consider sports entertainment. Oh yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, so yeah. entertainment on both sides then. So who's yeah. your team? Who's your, is it college or is it is it your uh, you pro? Know, are you, are I, you a Titans Ryan, guy? I got to be honest with you, man. I, I got to be honest. When people started putting politics into football, um, I haven't been watching as much as I used to. I, I got to be honest with you. You know, um, <laughs> to me, to me, sports was always my escape away from political turmoil and BS. You know, I wanted yeah. to go to a game and kind of immerse myself in a game and look at my sports heroes and do all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, then it just turned into political conflicts and all that stuff. So I've given it a little bit of a break and I've spent my time in the studio. Oh, well, come on back. Come on back to the NFL. It's going to be a good season this year. I, mean, I hope I've so. been able, I've been able to filter it out. I mean, I'm in the toughest division of all time. I'm obviously AFC West. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, so the Raiders are my team. But, okay. I mean, all the teams that are that are in the AFC West are huge contenders. You live in a market where the Titans are. But you know what, folks? That's another whole can of worms that I don't want to get into because that would be ball talk. All I want to do right now is give uh, Nelson Gunner the uh, stage right now to say his links one more time where everybody would like to go see him and where they can check it out and of course uh the new music that's coming out uh gunner what's all the right, best well, way to get cool. i mean well we're we're all over the place guys so the the easiest way to find us is just just google nelson twins and we'll come up and we've got all our facebook instagram uh snapchat everything is all there uh for you but uh, we also have an old school site as well but uh it's pretty easy to find us it's not it's not difficult at all but we'd love to see you out there on the road this year there you go uh gunner nelson thank you so much for taking so much time uh, so much of your precious time thank you everybody in the uh, chat that has been hanging out our next week's guest that we have it's a toss-up we don't know yet um we might have guy griffin from the choir boys uh talking about dropping some bombshells about what's going on or we might have damiano david of manskin we do not know it's going to be a mystery but you know what one thing's for sure we will look back upon this episode with gunner and i'm going to have a lot of references to go to now and and a lot of myths were debunked but you know what gunner 
you've been in the trenches. Uh, you have any final words for uh, the people watching? Uh, words to live by. You've probably been given a lot of great advice over the years. Um, maybe words to live by. Um, anything that you sort of use as a mantra? In sure, your life? sure, sure. You know, look, I think we've all been through an incredibly difficult time for the last two and a half, three years, and it's unprecedented. I, you know, I'm I'm raising daughters right now, and I'm trying to let them know that this normal is not normal. Um, but I will say this, things are looking up. People are, people are actually feeling better about the world. And, uh, and people are feeling if they were scared, they're feeling safer, they're going to concerts and stuff. But the one thing I will say, um, there are a lot of bad people out there that want us to uh, feel like we're isolated and separated and different from one another. And the one thing that I've always known is I've, I've never been in the entertainment business, I've been in the connection business. And that's what music has always done is bring everybody together. So don't let the bad people out there that make you feel insecure and make you feel isolated um, fulfill their agendas. We're all in this together. Be kinder to each other. Be gentle to each other. Uh, they are difficult times for everybody. And just keep that in mind. You never know what kind of day you're walking in on somebody on. And uh, you know what? Just remember that uh, the music can keep us all together and keep us focused on, on making a better world moving forward because, man, it's been a train wreck for the last three years. Well, Gunner. You know what? We've been on a train the last couple hours uh, for talking, and I appreciate you. We've gone in a lot of different directions, but I'm so happy that you came on. I'm so appreciative. Um, I, I knew we would get along uh, when we would start talking and we, and we wouldn't stop talking, but I just want to thank you one more time for being on. Best of luck with Firstborn Sons. Best of luck with everything that you have going on. Uh, it, it is Firstborn Sons, right? I'm getting it's that first, right. It's Firstborn Sons. And Ryan, thank you for everything that you do for everybody all over the world. You know, you're a, a world traveler and stuff, and you're a busy guy too. And uh, uh, please, please tell Vince we send our love and and absolutely uh, and glenn tell him that he's still a great drummer <laughs> and, well, you know uh, what glenn's a great drummer just ask him yeah. um, I, I said that earlier but guess what our paths will cross again and next time we're in nashville we're hanging out and uh, we're going out and may who knows maybe we'll end up in a scrap metal show together you hey, never I'd know love right that. I, i'd love that i think that would be great and make sure you say hello to nita for me too because I, I have a secret crush, will. but what can I say? Uh, okay. Well, there you go. And make sure you say hello to Stefan when you do his vinyl podcast. Oh, and of course, there she yeah. is, yeah. Andy Loving. It, <laughs> thank you very much, Vic, for holding down the ropes again. Thank you, Federica, for everything. Most of all, uh, thank you, everybody in the chat that day in and day out, week in and week out, you guys support the podcast. Uh, our special guest today has been Gunnar Nelson. Folks, thanks so much. Until next time, enjoy the ride. Seriously. Trenches with Ryan Roxy.